All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us for our annual ELA conference. I'm Dr. Millie Tien. My name is Mathilde Roman. Yes, um, and we, I, I'm, I am the uh, Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Inclusion here at NYMC. And I am the Chief Equity and Inclusion Diversity Officer for WMC Health. Yes, and we've been partnering uh, with, uh, with each other for this conference for really, I think maybe about 10 years or so uh, in our, at our institutions. And really, you know, for those of you who know, are familiar with uh, Henrietta Lacks, you know that uh, Henrietta Lacks was a young uh, African-American woman who was getting her care at Johns Hopkins uh, University Hospital. Um, her cells were, were, you know, she had a biopsy done and those cells were used for extensive amounts of research um, uh, with a, which led to a great deal of profit uh, over the course of many years uh, by both Johns Hopkins and other institutions. Uh, interestingly, just this past summer, uh, the family did get a settlement uh, with Johns Hopkins. And I think the family has had a sense of some, some degree of closure uh, for, the, for what's happened with, with, their, with their family members' cells without her consent. Um, this year, uh, as Matilda and I got together and thought about, you know, what what should this year's conference be about? And I think everyone knows that there's been a huge boom of AI. Um, and some people, people say AI, they don't even know what AI stands for. Um, and we felt that it was going to be a really important time um, for us to talk about AI uh, and also just talk about the how AI could be leveraged to address health disparities and make sure that it doesn't widen uh, those disparities. Yes, I agree. And I think you know the, there's a lot of promise in our artificial intelligence and creating greater efficiencies and optimization of care delivery and helping improve disease diagnosis and treatment selection. But there's also a potential risk associated with the use of AI um, in that it can worsen the impact of biases and inequities within the healthcare system. And I, I think that it was really important for us to really delve into that, um, that conversation and bring experts to really discuss and do a deeper dive so that we have a, a stronger framing um, and awareness about AI and, and its impact in healthcare. Yes, absolutely. And we before we go any further, um, I do wanna uh, invite our, our Dean of the School of Medicine, Dr. Schluger, to come up and give some remarks. And following his remarks, we have a jam-packed schedule. We're gonna be going into full gear uh, to get through the, the day's agenda. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Mill. Thank you, Mathilde, for uh, organizing this conference, which I'm sure is going to be very, very interesting and uh, meaningful and worthwhile. And I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of uh, the School of Medicine at New York Medical College, the whole medical college, really. I just want to reflect on uh, one thing that I think is very much in the spirit of this conference, and it's a uh, an anecdote, a story that I remember from very, very early in my career. Um, my first faculty appointment was at NYU and the clinical part of my job included running the tuberculosis clinic at Bellevue Hospital. Um, in, this was in the early 90s at a time of an enormous TB epidemic in New York. And we had some funding from the Robert, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that allowed us to link uh, our TB clinic with some of the social service agencies on the Lower East Side of Manhattan uh, so that we could really integrate medical care with the social needs of patients with tuberculosis. Um, and those needs were great. And um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded us to, to do some of that uh, along with uh, similar sites in Florida, Texas, and one in Baltimore. And as part of the program, the grant funding program, we would get together at these various sites and hear from people in the community. And, and I remember that when we went down to Baltimore, um, we were uh, addressed by, in a, in a small meeting, um, a minister from one of the African-American churches in East Baltimore. That's the neighborhood in which Johns Hopkins is located. Um, and his community would receive care, uh, at least in part, from that institution. Um, and this was years before, many years before 
The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, that book was published. Um, and I'll never forget what this minister said about the relationship between his community and the academic medical center that was its neighbor. He said he always, the, the people in his community, he said, always felt that the medical center was more interested in studying them than taking care of them. Um, and that remark has stayed with me for my entire career um, because I think it really encapsulates so much of um, what we're trying to address in conferences like this. Um, the, the idea that um, our patients are human beings that we should see as people in need. They're not data points. They're not just material for studying so we can write papers and feel good about what we're doing, but they're individual human beings deserving of dignity and respect. Um, and I think the conference today uh, really is very much in that spirit. It addresses a very important development in medicine uh, that I think many of us are interested in and also nervous about. And I think understanding the impact of artificial intelligence on many different communities is something uh, that we need to take very, very seriously. Um, and work very hard on. Um, so as I said, I've never forgotten that um, statement that um, we don't wanna be more interested in studying people than taking care of them. And I look forward uh, to learning today about uh, how artificial intelligence can help us actually take care of people and, and treat them uh, better as human beings, no matter who they are, where they come from, um, what language they speak uh, or what their problems may be. So thanks very much. Uh, uh, Mill and Matilde for organizing this, and I look very much forward to uh, learning with you this afternoon. Thank you so much for your opening remarks. I would like to, um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our first speaker, Marie Asher, who is the uh, Lillian Hedricks Hubber Endowed Director of Philip Capacio MD Library here at New York Medical College. She also holds faculty appointments in the School of Medicine and the School of Health Sciences and Practice. She's also Director of the Critical Appraisal Institute for Librarians, a continuing education course aimed at enhancing librarians' capacity in clinical epidemiology and teaching and evidence-based practice. So without any further ado, I wanna introduce Ms. Asher. Just gonna, we're just going to share the disclosures. These are these are all of our speakers' disclosures, so you all can be aware of potential conflicts of interest. Go to the next slide. So I, I, the lesson is when you you ask Dr. Etienne if there's anything you can help him with with this program, you might end up on the program. Uh, and, but I'm really happy to be here. I get to give the the nuts and bolts, and I think sort of do some level setting. Uh, to make sure everybody knows some of what we're talking about when we get into some of the more specifics of some of the programs that are going out on throughout uh, New York Medical College. So uh, as the first thing I decided to do was just, I had, a, I had an inkling that if I looked for an image using the Dolly image generator, which is an AI image generator, uh, and I pulled up a picture of a librarian, that it might be sort of telling. Uh, so I just wanted, could someone just sort of yell out what what you might see in this image that specifically speaks librarian to you? <laughs> Glasses. What, what else do you see? Lots of books. Sweater. A sweater, a cardigan sweater, the uniform of the librarian. There's lots of things in this picture. You see here a um, the return books here. Here, she's dressed sort of drably. Um, she's wearing glasses. Notice there's no computer on the desk. It's all, it's all about books. It's really a display of archetypes of what we think of a, of, of a librarian. And I say archetypes nicely because really it's stereotyping. Uh, it's it's stereotyping. Um, they, anything else you notice about that sweater? By the way, I just want to point out the the sweater. You see how the buttons drip down the front there? That's it. That's how. That's one of the ways you can really tell this is AI. It, it doesn't really know what buttons do, 
Uh, I call that, I'm going to call that now, there's a word for that part of your shirt, uh, your sweater, it's called a placket. So she's got a dangling placket. Um, and the, the people behind her are interestingly like very old and um, <laughs> staid looking themselves. So it's a very, very uh, interesting scene. My points that I really want to make here that is that AI, it really is rife with stereotyping um, of all kinds gender stereotyping. And it also leans toward, somebody said when they think of a librarian, they think of an older woman, probably with gray hair, maybe her hair up in a bun. Uh, interestingly, AI tends towards young, female and white uh, as the default. Okay, so take a note of that as you, as you use these, uh, these resources. Another example that, that gained some notoriety is this one from Twitter. Uh, where Ivana Bartoletti, who is the director of Women Leading AI, tweeted that she had asked for G Chat GPT to write a story about a, a boy and a girl choosing their subjects for a university, and its response clearly contained sexist gender stereotyping. Whereas the in the narrative, the boy was interested was interested in science and technology and loved tinkering with machines and gadgets. Whereas the, the girl in this story said she didn't think she could handle, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, that the girl loved painting, drawing, he couldn't handle the creativity. She loved painting, drawing, and expressing herself creatively. So I repeated this experiment several times. Many months later, thinking maybe the thing might have learned by then, and in every single instance, the boy in the story did something with STEM, and the female was interested in a, in a career in the fine arts. I asked ChatGPT about this. I talked to it like it's a person sometimes. And I said, you know, what's, what's the story with that? And it responded saying, what you see here on the screen, which you probably had a chance to read, that basically that it, that it, was, that it was a narrative decision but it, it didn't mean to perpetuate any stereotypes. And it's as if ChatGPT knows the right answer, but somehow cannot break stereotype when it's giving its responses. I think it's very interesting. So we're gonna to talk today about AI literacy and the kind of things that people need to know. And I'm actually gonna to add to this before I even get there, a number five, which is actually to be aware of ethical issues and biases inherent in, in, AI, in AI. But also just defining artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural networks, understanding the nature of training data, sources and type, understanding the probabilistic nature of machine learning, gaining the ability to form prompts that will give you the desired output that you seek, and checking for accuracy, which is really big. So we're gonna go through some of this. What do we mean by artificial intelligence? Um, generally, artificial intelligence is not necessarily one thing. It, it's, a, it's, a several, it's, a, it's a set of approaches. It's changed over time. So it has a, a long history and it's not always been the same approach. We're sort of leaning towards a certain approach these days, but it really is a broad set of approaches aimed at creating machines that have intelligence. Uh, machine learning algorithms that can learn a set of rules by studying a large amount of existing data, which we call training data, combined with Bayesian probability to either create something new like text, images, drugs, make predictions, provide estimates, analyze images, propose diagnoses, correlate symptoms and bio biomarkers with prognoses, facilitate precision medicine, and so on. We're looking at driving cars, and I would love for it to make me some breakfast someday. I keep on thinking I, I wanted like Rosie the robot when I, when I, when I was a kid. Um, so why now are we, as Mill said, so many conversations going on about uh, artificial intelligence? And there's several things that happened over the last decade, uh, last two decades, that sort of brought us to the moment where we are now. Number one were refinements in machine learning and actually a re, 
introduction of the idea of neural networks, which had been sort of shoved aside for a while, um, and deep learning. The second thing is the availability of so much data, big data, um, that like we've never seen before, and, and, the, and an emerging field of data analytics. And third, and maybe most important right now, is the computing power that's required to make AI run. Okay, so a couple things just to, to bring up here is that the compute power that, that we have now generally contains different types of processors that, that we used to have that allows things to run deep and multi multiple operations going on at the same time. These are called graphical processing units. And also fast enough. And this, is, this cannot be understated. When you put in this, how many of you have used chat GPT, by the way? When you put in something, isn't it amazing how fast it comes back? And you know it has no actual brain, right? It's, 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 it's doing a series of probabilistic calculations to determine what would be the like, most likely words to, to appear next in a sentence. That has, for that to occur, it ha the, the speed has to be so fast. And I just want to give you this, and I wrote this down so I could have it. So this, these thing called flops, um, flops are referred to as floating point calculations. And the, it's a measure of how many calculations can be performed in a second in orders of magnitude. So for instance, one exaflop, at that speed, a computer is capable of performing one quintillion floating point operations per second. One quintillion operations per second. To match what one EFLOPS computer system can do, it'd be like performing one calculation every second for over 31 billion years. Okay, that cannot be like underestimated. So, so we couldn't do that before. We could, but now we can. Processors are faster and and smaller, uh, and we can actually we 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 can see these things happening. So these three things: machine learning, computing power, big data, all together, brought us to where we are starting to see real progress in the promise of our artificial intelligence, whether we want it or not. So you've probably heard that artificial algorithms need to be trained in order to work. So there's basically three different types of training, supervised training, unsupervised training, semi-supervised training. Supervised training needs and requires large amounts of structured, pre-labeled human data. Okay, I mean data that requires humans to input it, which means it's very expensive, time consuming and laborious. Unsupervised data, training data, it's actually a lot more, less time consuming for humans, but less accurate, okay? It's unlabeled data, free form data. Um, that can happen, uh, actually, these systems are pretty good at learning languages. So national, uh, natural uh, language processing occurs using very often unsupervised techniques. And semi-supervised is becoming more and more common. It allows you to use a smaller set of pre-labeled data and then add other data uh, and can give pretty high accuracy with less data and less work. Data sources, this is what I said, it's everywhere. Um, we've got research results, health record data, public photos, internet scraping, publicly available content, personal health devices like rings and watches, um, medical images, patient portals, data in all formats. Just think about this when we go back to what we were talking about before, the data usually is not labeled and not structured. So there is a huge amount of human work that needs to go into um, to actually creating the AI systems in supervised learning. Okay, so I was specifically asked by a neurologist to, to, to talk about artificial neural networks and what these mean. And I'm actually going to pull in an example um, 
that comes from a, a, a book called Neural Networks for Babies, which I think is, is wonderful at sort of bringing it way back to something that people can really understand. You can see lots of images on the internet that really don't show you what it's doing. So I like this one. Uh, essentially, if you are doing something where you're trying to identify what an object is, when you train the neural network, you tell it that starfish are star-shaped and have this sort of ringed texture to it. And you'll tell it that sea urchins are oval-shaped, maybe striped. And what it does is it's, it's it, does a, it does a map. It says, okay, a, this one has this characteristic and this characteristic, and these have this characteristic and this characteristic. And then you go and you run it. And when you run this, Say you've actually run it, but you've introduced a shape it hasn't seen before and a starfish. With the starfish, you'll see by the red lines that it accurately actually could tell. It said, yes, that's a starfish. And it actually, it, it, it sort of, what you would say in neurology is that it fired, right? It, it, the, the, the synapse fired and, and it, it pushed it through and it gave the proper outcome. When you, when, AI or when a neural network is, is, comes across something that it hasn't seen before, it tries to do the mapping. Similar to what, I, what, a, what a human brain would do. I've got a thing, what do I see? It's kind of oval, maybe it's a sea urchin. That's all it knew. Um, and so it gave a weak, the yellow line there is, is implying that it's giving it a, a weak um, match basically to to that. So this is a very simple example that in terms of recognition, pattern recognition that is going on uh, at the very base level. But what you have to understand is what happens in our everyday life and is that this is a multi-layered process that's going on. So instead of having one or two layers, you have millions of layers running at the same time. For instance, to do something like driving. Driving has turned out to be one of the most difficult things for them to program um, with AI as hard as they've tried. They thought it would be easy, but it's not. Um, so the other, very recently there was an accident in, in Arizona with a, one of these cars driving in one of these zones where they can drive because it comes across something new and it doesn't know what to do with it. So whereas it can be harmless, like doing a, a placket on a sweater that dangles past the bottom, it can be actually um, tragic in the case of, of uh, driverless cars. Most of you have probably seen ChatGPT, or many of you have seen ChatGPT. So this is not your grandmother's chat bot. Uh, this is, this is um, a whole new, animal basically it stands for generative meaning it can create things pre-trained transformer okay transformer it are transformers are deep learning models that can transform sequential data such as text in the it such as text when we're talking about like natural language processing which it does extremely well um it's based on a very large and deep pre-trained language model, which was 570 gigabytes of data, which is roughly equal to over 1.3 million books. Many more than we have down, down, down in the BSB. Um, so as I mentioned previously, the release of the, to the public of ChatGPT has really ignited discussions about AI. You can ask it questions. You can have it draw illustrations in multiple styles. It passed the USMLE step one exam with a 60% um, and did terribly, by the way, in practice-based questions. Um, it can answer patient questions, which, which uh, a recent article in JAMA showed that they did better in many, in most cases than doctors who probably didn't have enough time to give the, the detailed answers that ChatGPT gave them. Uh, so they were more satisfactory to the patient, to the patients who were asking the questions. This ha was happening, by the way, on like a subreddit. Um, so how much time doctors are spending answering questions on subreddit is probably not that much. Um, 
the the data that goes in here. So you can ask it anything, right? It, it's actually really fun uh, to ask it things. And it's just mind blowing to think of what's going on in the background in terms of the probabilistic uh, calculations that need to take place for it to produce human sounding language. The language that it comes out of it, however, to me, is very sort of lowest common denominator. It's because it's it's acting on the mean, okay? So don't use it to be to write things because it's going to be pretty boring overall. But it can be pretty good for helping you frame ideas. Like put a put in a question like this, and it gives you some things to think about. Okay, so some problems, um, hallucinations, confabulations. When it doesn't know what to do, like I said before, it will make things up. So it might cause like false, po false positives in that neural network object identif identification. Um, it might make weird things like a sweater hanging down. It can create citations that are completely made up. Um, it can present false information as fact. And like I said before, it's average by design in terms of the, the information that comes out unless you train it to act at, at sort of like the 95 percentile. Um, AI plagiarism is a big deal in, in schools and um, journals off journals are, you know, questioning what role it, it might play in, in writing, which can actually be a, an issue as well. Minimizes personal taste, flattens the culture, perpetuates biases and stereotypes present in society because it, that those uh, biases and stereotypes were present in the training data. Quickly note that there are currently 4,438 clinical trials published in PubMed. There are frameworks for appraising those articles, which I actually do want to point out that, you know, similar to like when you're appraising an RCT, it'll ask you things like what were your sample size, were they, were they randomized? But the, the appraise AI will also ask you how inclusive was the data? Was there a bias assessment? for subgroup analyses to assure that some groups are not harmed by the model are included within, within the appraise AI framework. So AI equality, I think there, there is um, things that we should think about and promote. One is the equitable access to tools. I think that actually the idea that everybody has access to help them with their writing, uh, not just those people who might have access to a tutor to help them with their writing. Um, that equitable access to AI-enabled healthcare, and then the mitigation of biases, ways that we might do that. Um, make sure that the data sets are diverse and inclusive and representative, that there's regular auditing of, the, of the, both the training data and the outputs, that there's transparency in the algorithm, that you have a diverse group of collaborators working together, um, and that in general, that your, that your healthcare is patient-centered and value-centered. So this is my closing image. The other thing you can do is you can tell it what you want. Okay, so in this case, I actually specifically said, I would like an image. I didn't want her to be so young. That, that, that girl in the first thing could not have had a master's degree. <laughs> I'd like an image of a middle-aged female African-American medical librarian in a library. The library should be a modern library space, brightly lit, fewer books than an older library, more computers and study desks. The patrons in the library should be a diverse group of medical students. And the librarian should not be wearing a stethoscope and white coat. It would not let go, no matter what. Once I made a medical librarian, it decided she needed to have a stethoscope on to indicate that, okay? Again, sort of like an archetype. So that's really it for me here today. I'm really excited to see re the rest of the presentations. Uh, I hope you learned something. Thank you. Excellent intro. Now, does, do medical librarians also wear white coats? <laughs> I thought that she was wearing a white coat also. There, there are some refreshments in the back, just so you all know, if you, in case anybody wants to grab uh, one of the refreshments. I'm going to move on to our next speaker. So 
So the way we we structured this conference was we wanted to start with the basic. Uh, so so you saw Maria Asher just gave you the really the basic nuts and bolts of what AI is uh, to give you a general understanding. And when it comes to these hallucinations, false citations, I know I've seen that um, there have been like court cases where they actually cited false precedents, like things that didn't even exist um, in making their decisions, which is kind of, uh, you know, helping make their decisions, which is kind of interesting. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Benson Babu. Uh, Dr. Babu is a leading expert in healthcare innovation and the application of artificial intelligence. Uh, he trained in internal medicine at the Cleveland Clinic and his career spans over two decades as a hospital medicine physician. Uh, furthermore, he completed his physician executive MBA at the University of Tennessee. As an assistant professor at New York Medical College, Dr. Babu is deeply engaged in healthcare AI research and has mentored numerous medical students on research and publications related to AI. Uh, he is currently developing a fourth year elective course on AI healthcare at NYMC, authored several books on healthcare AI, such as Zero Click and Advanced Provider Assistance Systems. Uh, Dr. Babu holds certifications from both Harvard and MIT in designing and implementing AI solutions in healthcare, as well as the American Board of Artificial Intelligence in Medicine. I have a bit more, but I think I'll, I'll stop there. So we have give him plenty of time to, to speak, Dr. Babu. And I've also worked with him a, a good amount also doing some healthcare AI research. Okay, thank you, Mill. Pleasure to be here, everybody. I have no disclosures. What I'm gonna be talking about is the potential use cases for AI, its market, the current development pipelines from prototype to, to a clinical implementation, its regulatory framework, the current state of AI in terms of clinical use cases, as well as emerging technologies. Currently as physicians, we are all under administrative burden, burnout, all related to manual clicking, using, um, <clears throat> taking time away from actual patient care, billing, coding, compliance, and pre-authorization to just name a few. And this slide shows you how much time it takes to use this EMR system and <clears throat> provide manual data entry as opposed to taking, taking precious valuable time away from patient care. Potential solutions that AI can <clears throat> create for is to reduce the cognitive load, reduce burnout, and reduce the manual entry that we technically do at this time and automate these tasks, improving operational inefficiencies. The current healthcare AI market has now grown to about 40% over the past eight years, and it continues to grow. FDA now has approved about 700 devices over the past, this was just released two weeks ago in Nature. Ongoing clinical trials, about 300 to validate this in the real world setting. And now the regulatory frameworks have become more mature. The United States is now developing an AI Bill of Rights, as well as the AI EU Act that's already in motion. Similarly, <clears throat> our president has developed a safety committee that was just released about a few weeks ago for continuous monitoring of businesses for inclusion and, and fairness as well as support from the American Medical Association along the same framework. When developing and implementing these solutions, you have to figure out a specific use case, which is either both business and clinical, <clears throat> a clinical solution. You have to have infrastructure and also show the ability that it would reduce the clinical burden and have a good human clinical interface, as well as good measurements on performance and then your overall regulatory framework, making sure that the risks are mitigated. Several risks that we've already discussed were algorithmic bias, inclusion fairness bias, we're not incorporating certain demographic groups, and the lack of generalization. When you train a AI system on one patient population, it doesn't generalize and give you a good performance in another hospital setting. You have to control for unintended outcomes 
And the lack of explainability, because these systems are very complex and there's advanced computations, you can't explain it sometimes. As well as information gets changed over time. Incoming data gets changed, and that needs to be adjusted to the model so it reads it properly. And we have bad actors in our society, unfortunately, that can modify and create noise to modify the outputs of these AI models. Algorithmic best practices is to reduce the cognitive burden, capture the physiologic data in real time, and provide the solution in clinical implementation seamlessly. A lot of the regulatory frameworks was built upon the, uh, Microsoft's Ethics and Safety Committee that's been uh, adapted for a few years now. And the questions that the committee routinely audits is, is your AI system fair? Is it inclusive? Is it reliable, transparent, private? And who is accountable for this if something happens? Along this, along the pipeline of, of developing, we have to make sure that there's no bias and there's mathematical ways on how to adjust for bias at, when developing these prototypes and during clinical implementation. And this is an article that was released by MIT uh, showing exactly how, what the issues are and how to tackle this. It's an active area of research. The current state of AI in healthcare. We have autonomous AI systems which detect retinal <clears throat> diabetic retinopathy that's being deployed out into the primary care setting and low resource environments that don't have ophthalmologists. And this was about 2017 and there's full reimbursement for that from CMS. Stroke protocols are now being uh, detected by AI, which is the ischemic strokes. And including that, they have a new algorithm which was released by FDA just a few weeks ago which is hemorrhagic detection and volume assessments. And this is actively being implemented in clinical care now. Our medical team here, our medical student team has driven a research project. It's due for publication in Frontiers Medicine. It's a systematic review looking at the, the assessment of stroke pathways in the, uh, de by detection of AI. And how it does is, what we found is it improves the overall workflows and improves the speed from detection of a stroke when the patient hits the, the ER to the intervention and notification of the interventional team. And then right now, the technology is nascent, so we don't have enough data to show clinical outcomes or costs, but we're going to wait to see what the, the next few years will, sh will show. Other applications that have been now being used in cardiology is the CT chest FFR assessment to figure out the degree of coronary occlusion without the need for intervention. And now this is part of the clinical chest flow guidelines and this figures out which, through AI, it shows exactly how bad the degree of coronary occlusion is and which person is candidate for cardiac catheterization and it's pretty accurate. And this is the guidelines that they're being incorporated, this CT FFR. Ambient intelligence solutions, Kaiser Permanente, uh, can, it's similar to Alexa being placed into rooms called smart rooms. It's able to listen in on the patient to doctor relationship and then generate out a template with the, the coding environment and it improves workflow. Their initial pilot shows that it has improved the overall Pajama time for, for providers, that means the amount of time outside of the work that's needed for manual typing, as well as the preservation of the quality of these notes. Emerging technologies, large language models like ChatGPT, as we spoke about, the, it's, these are emerging technologies, but how fast paced this happens within six months things change. Six months to about two years, it's rapid development and implementation of these systems. We have to make sure that the, uh, all the groups for inclusion and fairness are incorporated with uh, mitigating the degree of hallucinations and other issues with adversarial attacks to, for bad actors that can, um, that can create harm for patients.
And our medical, our medical team students are developing a, another research project looking at how best to adopt these medical uh, language models towards medicine. You can tailor it towards the medical field. And then we're looking at mitigation strategies on how to mitigate hallucinations technically from a technical perspective and how to mitigate, how to include bias and preserving the performance of output. So that's, I'm pretty excited for that. University of, University of Toronto, their data engineer teams, they, <clears throat> what they did was they automated clinical workflows through the ER and pediatric setting. When, when kids came into the ER, they developed a machine learning solution that were able to automate the routine clinical tests, such as imaging, labs, and that showed that it had improved their workflows, the timing. Patient-generated data, we discussed a little bit earlier that through watches, rings, sensors, we're able to generate all that data. And there's a lot of hospitals that are using that data and streaming it, trying to streaming it into the EHR system. For example, Mayo Clinic is well known for that, for their ongoing active research. On the same token, you have driver-assisted autonomous systems that are able to detect driver fatigue, hypoglycemia through behaviors, gesture recognition, a vertical nystag I mean, nystagmus, and also the driving deviation. And then that information can get streamed into the hospital. And this is a New England Journal article that shows that this has shown that instead of invasive glucose testing, you can use behavioral, like patient, the gesture recognition to figure out who's hypoglycemic and it's, it's pretty accurate. All of these sensors are all integrated and can all be integrated throughout the whole, starting from the hospital to cities. And this is like similar to an ICU environment where they have a lot of sensors, all of it physiologically can get integrated and then you can get uh, real-time outputs from the machine learning. For example, fall risk detection. You can see patients at fall risk by using special specialized cameras. You can see who's at risk for congenital cardiac disease based on facial morphology, and the list goes on and on. Ambient intelligence, we, we touched a little bit about it, and now it's becoming more advanced by attaching more different features onto it. Ambient intelligence is using a combination of computer-based, uh, camera-based technologies to figure out uh, who's at risk for stroke, who's at risk for infections, who's, who's providing hand washing in smart hospital systems. And they have smart sensors and it's integrated with cameras and speakers and it provides all the information. And all of this in the next few years will be integrated with uh, ambient intelligence speakers to produce your interaction with the provider and the patient into the EMR system seamlessly without, uh, without the need for manual clicking. And it, this is able to detect, for example, a patient comes in with low extremity swelling, the, the camera is able to detect it, and then the, the speech recognition system is able to detect who's speaking, and then all of that information that gets inputted into the EMR system and outputted automatically so you can type it and tailor it and sign it fast. The Stanford is well known for this. They're the pioneers in this field that have already implemented the uh, infectious disease uh, washing, hand washing, and they showed that patients who didn't hand wash, uh, they figured out what patients who didn't hand wash with their cameras and who did, and that was really helpful in the COVID setting. This is another Stanford study. They did computer vision-based assessments for surgical skills, and they see intraoperatively that you see who's, uh, how the surgeon's skills are, who, how, by the use of the tools, how fast they use it, the blood loss, and they're able to predict who, you know, the mortality they compared it against expert surgeons with residents and the motor skills and how fast they use these tools and what kind of tools they use by gesture recognition technologies. And then it quantitates how much blood loss you have and gives you an ass assessment of the mortality risk perioperatively. This is pretty exciting. Extended reality, especially from the medical school kind of uh, scenario, there's a lot of medical schools that are using this for educational purposes, for cardiac, uh, ACLS, <clears throat> and uh, they have Surgi uh, surgical 
the surgeons over at, for example, Singapore has a hollow medicine program where they use extended reality. Extended reality transforms your reality and then overlays a virtual object on it all the way towards a virtual, a virtual uh, simulation of an environment. There's a spectrum. And what I mean by that is it, intraoperatively, if you want to figure out a pediatric <clears throat> uh, liver transplant cases, they have a preoperative planning and assessment by using the these video headsets or holograms that take a look at the, the donor's liver and it's able to superimpose on the uh, the patient, the the child's area to see if it fits. And and the church, they use it both pre-surgical planning, intraoperatively. Uh, so for example, your CT images and MRI images can be superimposed on the patient intraoperatively to figure out mapping and everything. They're using this actively in their Hall of Medicine Fellowship Program. And they have about 100 cases per day with these applications with in conjunction with Microsoft and having low latency 5G networks to, to have the precision. Digital twins along the same line, you're able to develop precise medications. Digital twins is taking the digital, um, taking your physical object, whether it's a person, patient, hospital, and transforming it into a digital format with through the sensors that you have on either the patient or the hospital, it gets relayed into, the, into a digital twin. They're using this for surgery, for surgical cardiac valvular assessments to see if which valve would work for what patient in a digital patient and drug development for precision drug development, which is called MIPD or MIDD for precision drug develop development. It figures out the exact lock and key fit for the receptor and the drug over time on a, on the digital, digital format instead of a live person. And this tells you exactly the physical asset on the left here, whether it's a, a command center for a hospital seeing logistics, and you can review it in your business intelligence room by taking all of the information from the physical assets and you can review who's, which patients are not doing so well, which patients are doing well through sensors, and then how you can improve length of stay, or it can be the actual patient Siemens is developing similar lines of streaming all the physiologic data and providing a digital uh, replica of the patient and then trying different methodologies for treatment regimens, whether it's drugs or any other treatment. And that's it. You know, the emerging applications are pretty exciting. Uh, the field moved like lightning speed. Within six to six months to two years, things get implemented pretty quickly. So thank you. All right, we're gonna thank you very much for that excellent talk. I think so. The first two talks was really laying the framework for AI. We gave you a general overview, then we went into the AI and medicine overview. Um, any question? We have a, a few minutes for some questions for Dr. Babu, Marie Asher. I'll check the. I also want to definitely welcome our folks in Zoom world. Um, let's see if they have any questions. For those. Nope, oh, that's not a question. All right. Any any questions for the first two panelists? Crystal clear. <laughs> what's a what's a hallucination? <laughs> I'm hallucinating. Um so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Garrett. A, a great intro. Um so uh, uh, I'm very interested. We're we I do a lot of work in the hospital and obviously here as well, but we're implementing AI in our medical records. And one of the questions that we've had as we kind of go down this route, we already have a lot of it in radiology and we do some in other areas, but we're thinking about actually putting it in for all the medical hospice programs and in our pilot in the medical ICU. And one of the key questions that we keep asking that I would love to 
feel more comfortable with is how do we go about actually having any line of sight on what the algorithms are that are being used? You know, you mentioned that, you know, the chat GPT uses a million three books. That sounds like a lot, but in the great scheme of things, it's a little tiny amount of what's out there and there are millions of papers published. So how could a regular person who's not an expert in AI begin to figure out whether the algorithms being used are good, are equitable, or are misguided? Cool, instead. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Especially for non-technical individuals, we always want to know exactly how this was developed. And they have model cards. What a model card is, it's similar to a cereal box where they give you the nutritional information. The model card gives you the specifications on how it was designed, what data that it was used, what patient populations that were used, what features that are within the model, how the model works, what kind of model it is, and what are the metrics that were used to measure it and how the performance was. That's one. Then now we have a regulatory environment that's actually adapting for this as in terms of audits. The ISO SEC of 42001 has a specific protocol in place for auditors to audit and make sure that there is transparency, that there is fairness, inclusion, there's bias, there's no output issues, and they're following people who are implementing this are following a, a, a framework that you're able to pass. And if you pass that, it's equivalent to a certification similar to the American Board of Internal Medicine, similar to JCO certification. So you have two layers. You have the model cards. It tells you the breakdown. And then you have all the regulatory environment that ensures that we understand how these machines work. The only thing I want to add to that is that there, um, there's a big understanding that a lot of goes on with AI is happens within a black box. Um, so, so you don't always know, even if you know what it's doing, uh, you don't necessarily know what it did and how it came, how it came up with the answer that it came up with. So I think testing, making sure that you've, you're using a, 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 a system basically that is, uh, even though it's proprietary and you might not have all the code to it, that that you um, are regularly testing to see that it is um, reliable and concurrent with with the responses that your your clinicians would give. and structured labeled data. So it, uh, there's a lot that has to do with controlling your data. And there are tools now, for example, to figure out who is using large language models and to what degree it hallucinates and what degree is inaccurate. And you can deploy those models to figure out how the large language model is performing. Right now, the gold standard is the providers, the expert providers that provide that assessment. But with the tools such as, I, I know a group at Cleveland Clinic that's developed a model called Humily that's able to assess the hallucination degree, the inaccuracies, and you're able to, it gives the provider a tool to see, you know, how, how, you know, how inaccurate it is and then whether or not if we should follow those advice. Excellent. Let's give our first two speakers a round of applause. Thank you so much. Excellent. Now you can relax. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent start. Okay. So now that you've got the basics down, we're going to, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Philippe Duyon. He is a board certified neurologist. He graduated from NYMC school of medicine in class of 2007 and completed his residency in neurology at NYU followed by fellowship in clinical neurophysiology at NYP Weill Cornell Medical College. He spent five years as an attending uh, neurologist, epileptologist with the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group. Dr. Dion is the founder and CEO of the health, wellness, and technology company known as the Inla BrainFit Institute, which was created to improve people's health and quality of life. 
Through the BrainFit Institute, he has created an individualized exercise regimen based on the person's medical and neurological needs. Dr. Duyan's BrainFit app released in November 2018 is game designed to teach people about the impact of food and exercise on the brain and body. He's also the author of a book called Neuroplasticity, Your Brain Superpower, which speaks to the brain's ability to learn, adapt, and heal. In the book, he discusses actionable steps that we can all take to maintain a healthy brain. He has traveled the United States giving talks ranging from neurological disorders to ways that we can maximize our neurological potential. Dr. Dion is the creator and instructor of an online class, Take Charge of Your Brain in 30 Days. He is the co-founder of the Sarasync, uh, a healthcare technology corporation at the forefront of revolutionizing dementia care. Dr. Dion. Thank you. So good afternoon. So 20 years ago, I was a medical student right here while my maternal grandmother uh, was diagnosed with dementia. And I was watching her become a shell of who she used to be. In fact, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And she was really the matriarch of our family. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those shows or movies where families get together on Sundays and have this, these big family dinners. Well, that was us. We would get together every Saturday night at my grandmother's house and have these big family dinners. And they were one of the highlights of my childhood. But the moment that she was diagnosed with dementia, all of that came to an abrupt end. And I was a third year medical student when the disease that took away her memories and her identity eventually took her from us. And in, my, in the years since then, throughout my career, I've always wondered to myself, did we get that diagnosis right? Did she really have Alzheimer's disease? Maybe it was something else. Maybe it was something that was reversible, or at least treatable. Maybe it was due to vitamin deficiencies or thyroid dysfunction. Maybe it was because of her high blood pressure, or maybe she had diabetes. She loved these little caramel candies. She used to eat them all the time. In fact, I haven't even seen these caramel candies since she passed away. But that really sort of spearheaded a lot of the work that I do. And so here's my disclosure. I'm the co-founder of Seri Sync Corporation, which uses artificial intelligence and quantum technologies to address dementia care challenges. It is a uh, for-profit company. The World Health Organization tells us that by 2050, People over the age of 60, that population will double. The Alzheimer's Society tells us that age is the biggest risk factor for dementia. Currently, we have 6 million people in the United States living with Alzheimer's disease. We've got about 55 million people worldwide living with Alzheimer's disease. By 2050 in the United States, it's expected that that number is going to jump to 13 million people. And worldwide, it's going to jump to uh, about 80 million people. And so very soon, we're going to have large numbers of people that are being diagnosed with dementia and that are being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. But we're also going to have large numbers of people that are being completely misdiagnosed. And so what studies show us is that 50 to 70 percent of the population that is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease in the community setting are misdiagnosed. And those patients are symptomatic. The studies show us that people who go to memory clinics and receive a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, at least 25% of them are misdiagnosed. They're seeing memory experts, and they're still being misdiagnosed. Right? Overall, nearly one in four people who are clinically diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease don't actually have the disease. Part of the problem is that even in healthcare, we use dementia and Alzheimer's disease interchangeably, as if they mean the same thing. Alzheimer's disease is, a different, is one type of dementia. There are many different types of dementia. But when I'm seeing patients in, in the hospital or virtually, there's just a bunch of patients who have that diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, right? But there's nothing clinically to support that diagnosis. When you look at their labs, maybe their thyroids are off. You can certainly have vascular dementia. When you look at their CAT scans, 
vitamin D levels are low, which is low for everybody this time of year. B12 levels are completely low. It could be something completely different. And yet we're misdiagnosing, potentially misdiagnosing all these people. And so in general, we are not very good at diagnosing dementia, and we're not very good at diagnosing um, Alzheimer's disease. And we do get a little bit worse when we're dealing with population, when we're dealing with minority populations, right? So when we think about um, the amount of, the, the, the percentage of minority populations that are either underdiagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's disease or misdiagnosed, that percentage can vary. And that percentage can vary based on a lot of things, based on ethnic group, it can vary based on where in the country they live, it can uh, vary based on a bunch of different factors. But what is clear is that overall, all minority populations, African Americans, Hispanics, uh, Asian Americans, Native Americans are underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, which means that they are undertreated for dementia. There, are, uh, there was a study from the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease in 2018 that showed that when you look at all adults, all older adults in the United States who have dementia, at least 50% of Blacks and Hispanics don't have a formal diagnosis documented in their medical records. And in particular, what that study showed is even in uh, African Americans and Hispanics who clinically have dementia, you can't find that diagnosis anywhere in their chart, which means that when they're seeing their different providers, nobody's realizing that they potentially are suffering from cognitive issues, and therefore then they're not being treated properly. When we think about some of the challenges when it comes to uh, dementia diagnosis, it can be a lot of different things. One of the things that we see is often the, the level of education poses a challenge. People who have less than 12 years of formal education are more or who have less than 12 years of formal education are more likely to be misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. People who make less than $18,000 per year are more likely to be misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. There are certainly cultural and language barriers that make it very difficult to, to communicate, but also to understand people from different backgrounds. And so yes, you can have an, uh, an interpreter there, but if you don't understand the nuances of the culture of different populations, it's gonna be very difficult to make an appropriate diagnosis. And certainly there are provider biases that come into play, which impact our clinical judgment and decision-making uh, skills. So AI and quantum computing can certainly help with some of these, uh, by, can certainly help us minimize some of these barriers to um, appropriately, appropriately diagnosing people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. When we think of artificial intelligence, what artificial intelligence is very good at is learning from mistakes, right? So that way it can continue to get better and better and better at completing more and more complicated tasks. But artificial intelligence, the way that it works is that if you give it a problem, it needs to individually analyze every possible solution. Where quantum computing, if you give it a problem, it analyzes all possible solutions in that moment. So if you're looking at your, uh, your standard sort of computers that are limited in terms of how much information they can process at any given time, right? quantum computers are just much more powerful and allow us to look at vast data sets of information in order to, to make certain uh, decisions. And so I'll give you two examples of, of how this works. One is, if I were to give you a coin, right, and tell you heads or tails, and let's say you pick heads, and I flip this coin up in the air, right, and let's say it is heads, 
it's not telling you the full story. It's only telling you part of the story, right? But that part of the story is what your standard sort of computer is telling you. But as what quantum computing is doing, it's telling you the story as the coin is in the air. When the coin is in the air, it is both heads and tails at the same time. All things are possible with quantum computing. Another example is if you say one plus x equals 10, your standard computer will have to go through and say, OK, does 1 plus 1 equal 10? No. Does 1 plus 2 equal 10? No. Does 1 plus 3 equal 10? No. But your quantum computer will take every possible x variable all at the same time and say, OK, which one of these, 1 plus whatever, equals 10? And it will cancel out all the, the, wrong, uh, the wrong numbers. And so that makes it much faster and much more powerful. And so this means that with quantum computing, we can take vast amounts of data, data based on somebody's demographics, data based on medical history, data based on diagnoses, prescriptions, uh, biomarkers, and we can analyze all of that data at the very same time in order for it to give us possible solutions as to what's going on with that particular patient. And so when we think about how we can use uh, AI and quantum computing, right, it can answer a lot of questions for us very quickly. It can answer the questions, well, did my grandmother really have Alzheimer's disease? It can answer the questions of um, who's at risk for developing dementia or Alzheimer's disease. But it can also allow us to answer much more complicated scientific questions. It can allow us to answer questions like, how do we decode proteins? Proteins are the workhorses of the body. It goes DNA, RNA, proteins. Proteins help us. Obviously, they give us our muscles, which energize our body. It helps us to digest food. It helps us to fight off germs. Proteins are incredibly uh, important. And so when we think about the 20 amino acids that then go on to make up proteins, the structure that those, that protein takes is what determines its function. Function follows form when it comes to proteins. Right? And so when you look at some of the big um, companies out there like IBM or Google, they have large AI quantum machine learning computing power. They have programs that are allowing them to decode proteins and map proteins. And in fact, if you look at Google, I think they have something called DeepMind, where their artificial intelligence model allows them to predict the structure of proteins. And they're supposed to have a database that includes 100 million proteins. So why is this important, especially when it comes to dementia? Well, when it comes to dementia, it's thought that proteins play a significant role, especially when it comes to Alzheimer's disease and protein misfolding has been linked to Alzheimer's disease. If you're able to predict proteins when they're gonna misfold, uh, then you may be able to predict who potentially will develop Alzheimer's disease. If you're able to predict proteins, you may be able to create proteins, and you may be able to create new therapies that allow you to target those proteins. And so using AI and quantum uh, computing solutions, it allow us, allows us to potentially cure diseases that we used to think were completely uncurable. And so the first thing that we need to do when using AI and quantum computing is that we need to collect data. And we need to collect large amounts of data. We need to collect data about patients' demographic information, their medical records, their prescriptions, their genetics, different biomarkers, and when we collect all of that data, then we're able to use our quantum computers to analyze that data. And we can analyze that data so that way we can find specific patterns. And when we find those patterns, we can make determinations of you know, the, the diagnosis that the person has, the symptoms that they're going to have, and how best to treat them. And we can do it in real time. And so when, once we identify patterns, we don't need to wait if a patient sees me today, they don't need to wait three months for me to make an adjustment to what's going on, right? If I know 
that cognitively a patient does better when their average oxygen saturation throughout the day is 97, 98%. But today that I see that their oxygen saturation is 94%, I can tell them, look, you need to do some breathing exercises today. Let's get that oxygen saturation up. We can use biomarkers in real time to really help people when it comes to their cognitive functions. We also need to figure out and come up with culturally sensitive screening. In a world where everything seems to be digital, and I know in this room we have a clock, but oftentimes we don't see clocks. Is it really you know, advantageous in our dementia screening to have patients draw a clock, right? If that's not something that they're used to. And somebody who hasn't completed 12 years of formal education, is it advantageous to have them do serial seven backwards from 100 down to 50? That might be out of their, their wheelhouse. So we need to come up with things that are more culturally sensitive. We can certainly use um, AI and quantum computers to find um, uh, patterns in their images, patterns in biomarkers. And then we take all of that information, we put it into an algorithm that accounts for diversity and allows us to make accurate predictions in terms of somebody's diagnosis and how their disease could potentially evolve. And so some of the key recommendations, again, are we need to do early screening. A lot of times what we see is that somebody comes to see a neurologist, if they even come to see a neurologist, because some studies show that uh, a lot of people, especially minorities, don't follow up with a neurologist for a whole host of reasons. But early screening is important. If somebody has you know, rapid dementia, where they can no longer take care of themselves, it's really hard to manage that process. It's much easier to manage them when they're in a stage of maybe mild cognitive impairment, right? And so this shows, um, this is comparing diagnostic approaches early on in the disease process in minority populations. Our sort of approach allows us to diagnose about 15% of the time. When we combined our traditional methods with uh, AI-assisted diagnosis, we get up to 85% of the time. When we combine that with quantum computing, we can make an accurate, efficient diagnosis 95% of the time. Right? So with the dawn of AI and quantum computing, we stand at the precipice of a new era in dementia care. And these technologies will revolutionize early diagnosis. They'll unlock the mysteries of the brain. They'll unlock uh, what it means to have protein misfolding and it'll allow us to ensure quality care for everyone who needs it. And at Serisync, my company, that's essentially what we're doing. We are using AI and quantum machine learning to diagnose dementia early, to um, find ways where we can um, treat people early, but also predict how their disease is going to evolve and adapt to whatever is going on in their life in that moment to help them in their day to day. And I think the goal is to certainly live in a world that is completely dementia free. But until we get to that point, utilizing every single tool that we have at our disposal to allow people to preserve their cognitive function and live every year of their life, enjoying their life and having full use of all their cognitive faculties. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to introduce um, Eric Altschuler. He is the Associate Chief and Director of Clinical Research in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Metropolitan Hospital, and Associate Clinical Professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at New York Medical College. Dr. Altschuler is also a, an Associate Editor of the American Journal of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. He is a board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, brain injury medicine, neuromuscular medicine, and electrodiagnostic medicine. In addition to his clinical work, uh, Dr. Altschuler is widely published and recognized expert in clinically applied and basic cognitive neuroscience. Um, he was the first to report the use of mirror therapy following, uh, the st uh, following stroke and for the combination of amputation orthopedic injury. Dr. Atschuler was the first to publish the use of animal-assisted therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder, now in wide use for patients across the world, 
and his book on neuroscience of Bach music was published this month. Please give a warm, warm welcome to Dr. Altshuler. All right, th thank you very much. It's really a privilege, honor to be here. I have to say today's the last day of Black History Month. I'd like to start by acknowledging and commending our incredible residency program coordinator, Ms. Crystal Morgan. We've been working together for the last year to successfully remove the name of a traitor confederate, yes, with a capital C, from one of the main PM&R websites. It should not ta have taken a year, but it did, but we did get it done also from the VCU Department of Fiscal Medicine PM&R website. And I would uh, commend Dr. David Sifu, the chair there, for getting taking that off instantly uh, when we told him about it. Um, in uh, September 6, 2014, President Obama awarded the Medal of Honor, our nation's highest uh, Congressional Medal of Honor, our nation's highest honor to New York's own Lieutenant Alonzo Cushing for actions he took on July 3rd, 1863. And President Obama says it's never too late to do the right thing. Okay. And as Confederates, they're out there on came in our websites and we are continuing to do it. And I would like to also acknowledge Dr. Etienne. He's been very helpful and supportive in this and we're continuing in this. Um, I'd also like to say it's a privilege to be to share the program with Ms. Escher. Um, in medicine, there's a saying, if you take out someone's tracheostomy, you change it, you hold your breath while you're doing it because then you know how the patients feel. And, uh, you know, the neuroscience of Bach, a lot of neuroscience, a little bit of Bach. And uh, sometimes articles on neuroscience, the library has Bach, not always, um, which is appropriate because it's a medical school and we, uh, things are expensive. But I've needed them. I feel like this is unfair. I'm being oppressed or something. And I have to say, Ms. Asher and also uh, Irene and Mary Beth are very helpful in the ILL department to get me those articles. And, and, and I definitely feel... Um, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, diversity and, and equity, and, and I, I feel included when I get those articles. And I, I really appreciate it. Also say for the school, they do a great job. They save school a fortune because we don't have to buy all these journals. If you need it, they will get it for you. So just thank you very much. Um, uh, disclosures, we are developing an app. Maybe we can sell it for expressive aphasia. I'll talk about that. These are goals and objectives. If people are seeing me, I will talk about these. I won't waste time on these. You can read them. Um, you know, last century used to say, think globally, act locally. So uh, I want to talk about, uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about aphasia today, an app for that. Neuroscience is my thing. And I think I have an app that's going to uh, be very helpful uh, for, for everybody. I, I think in terms of um, equity, um, there are people who have aphasia and they physically cannot get to appointments for, for, for speech therapy. They don't have the money or insurance for speech therapy. Uh, these are very important. Also, uh, if you speak, if the patient and the therapist speech, speak a different language, good luck, okay? Or there's no luck, okay? So I think this is, and the app can really be helpful with this. I think it's important, but it's also for everybody. I think this will, this kind of thing will revolutionize uh, aphasia treatment uh, for everybody. Uh, it's gonna be like a crutch or a cane uh, for aphasia. And people wanna be able to talk. It's like a cane, they wanna be able to walk. They don't wanna be pushed that they don't have to be. And that's what we're gonna try to do. So um, I wanna solve a global problem, but uh, I'm working locally here. I just say uh, Nobel laureate in physics, Richard Feynman, he always said he found science's article very deceitful um, because uh, it was sort of all cleaned up and very logical by the time you read it. Uh, and it didn't really, it was didn't say the haphazard way you came upon things. Now, if you read his papers, the titles are inscrutable. Okay, but but he's got a point. And also, by the way, he, he sort of, his prize is for the ultimate uh, application of local things to the grand scheme of the of the universe. Um, so I'm going to give a, a little taste. There's not a lot of time, but of, of how we have come upon this. And also I'm going to show at the end the video. This is the first time we showed it publicly, a video of, of the app that one of my uh, colleagues, Fabrice, has made. Um, this one. Okay, so this is uh, Paul Broca. And this is, he uh, discovered, actually, Max Stack did before him, but, but he's famous for discovering expressive aphasia. You get left frontal part of the brain, right-handed, or if you're left-handed most of the time, you get an injury there. That was a, a gunshot, if I remember. Um, and, and you sort of can't talk effectively. You can understand this patient, you can understand, but you, you have trouble talking. Aphasia is a lot more complicated than that, but that's sort of the bottom line. Um, and the question is, how far have we, have we advanced since 1861? And the answer is, in treatment is basically not at all. Um, there was a paper in The Lancet four, four decades ago where they actually randomized people to... Um, uh, to speech therapy two or three hours a week with the therapist's best method, which was then and still the current standard of care, basically, or more if they wanted it. And the other group got nothing. They all got aspirin and blood pressure control at the same site. And after six months, there were improvement in both groups, but there was no difference. Uh, it's, it's a tough problem. Um, we'll see. Um, so 
<clears throat> so it started out. Um, we we just to briefly go through things. We 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 had a patient, and she had expressive aphasia, had trouble talking. We saw understood, and and she could she could count. I go one two, and she she could repeat, and that that's that's well known or conduction aphasia. There there are a lot of words that we'll see. There's we can explain that too, but. But essentially, I said, well, I said, one, two, three, can you keep going? She kept counting. I said, that's kind of interesting. That's not exactly in the books. Okay, I tried I tried two, four, six. Okay, tried Monday, Tuesday. She goes Wednesday, Thursday. So it's kind of interesting. So so I, at the time, so we, we presented this society for neuroscientists, Isan, um, the underlying, he was one of our PM&R residents, did a fellowship at Medical College of Wisconsin. He's a, a doctor in uh, Nebraska now. And so as you'll see the slides, I'm going to highlight the um, the trainees at, at various, uh, he's in, uh, so the underlying is the residents. Um, so Eason was a resident. We present this as Society for Neuroscience. I thought it was pretty interesting. And all the all the group, UCSF group came by, the Harvard group came by, the Stanford group came by. It's really kind of interesting. Now we use Q here with a Q U E, like a like queuing. You guys remember, you know what record is or DJ radio? Okay, like one would play and then one came, next one fall down. So like that that was the model. That was the model. If anyone remembers what those are. Okay, they always say, you know, they always describe the brain in terms of the, the current technology. You know, it was it was pipe organs in the 18th century, and you know, then it was uh, computers, and you know, okay, so every generation does that. Okay, we still haven't figured out. I, uh, I assure you. Uh, anyway, so so I thought that was that was really pretty cool. And we, and we saw this in a number of patients. We had Spanish speakers at Unidos, and they kept counting. So kind of interesting. Okay, so so just just briefly, I I want to I want to show this diagram. This is for a right-handed person, lefties. Uh, I guess you're not, not fully included here, but. If you're right-handed, like 90% of us are, you're not left-handed. Um, the, the main speech area, Broca's area is, sort of generates speech. Really what it does is what's called propositional speech. It kind of gets you going, basically. And that's all it does, actually. But that's a for another talk. And Wernicke's area is famous, too. Carl Wernicke, 1874, followed Broca. If people got a <clears throat> legion there, they, they could talk. They sort of buzz mumbo-jumbo, and they didn't understand. So what Wernicke basically does is it does a lot. We, we'll see a little bit more than people think. It, uh, it helps you understand Basically, you can understand if some if someone has a has a, a broke uh, a Wernicke's that you say raise your hand they can't do it they can actually if you if you mind they can do it that's another area of research area fifty five B is not as well known there was a paper in Nature in two thousand sixteen in MRI not fMRI uh, study parcellation they looked and th this lit up this um, put on the radar screen it was the language area they didn't really know what it did exactly but it was seen, it, 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 in uh, I, I read is an interesting paper. Um, interesting, they they found they went back and a guy, a, doctor, a physiologist named Hoff, he had published a paper in 1954 where the site of architecture of this area was different than all the others. Hoff actually was the second director of the Brodmann Institute. If you remember with Brodmann's areas of the brain, he took over for for Brodmann. And so uh, to me, that was even more impressive than the parcellation study. Uh, there had actually been this is kind of prefrontal. It's a little bit you you, you go to the motor, motor cortex, drive north on I-95 a little bit. You, Get to 55B, okay, further get to Broca's. And um, and so uh, there have been papers in the stroke literature for some decades that areas, uh, lesions around this area might uh, cause um, what's something called a practice speech. You can't articulate. We actually had a case where it was a very small, very, very small stroke just in this area. We published that as like, aha, we localized it without even having new brain surgery. Uh, Eddie Chang at UCSF, who's been a neurosurgeon, he's done a lot of technology work too. Then he had a patient where he cut out that area for, for intractable seizure treatment, and the guy woke up, he couldn't talk, then he read my paper. He's like, uh-oh, okay. But I think in that case, he had no choice. Obviously, there's tremendous awareness of that area now. It's not cut if it's not needs to be. And then Chang's group and others have done areas where they've stimulated those areas or recorded from them to and, and to, to get speech. And this that's it's the articulation area. This talk is, is beyond the scope of this talk, but but understanding of the role of 55B uh, with brokers and workers, that's the missing piece. Most of aphasia can be understood uh, with that. But again, that's beyond the scope of this talk, though I will show how that, that plays into what we've been doing. Um, so then up, uh, Alonzo, he must have made this slide. Okay, now he's underlined because he was actually, he's an MYMC alum. He's And now he's actually bold because he's going to be our resident starting in July. So we're very proud of that. Bruno is doing his internship in California. He obviously made this slide. Okay, and then, and then, and then, yes, I think, um, let's see, I, th I think, uh, let's see, I forget the attacks were, and, and, and Nick Thornton is, is one of our current residents, um, and so he's, he's underlined. So, so we, we had another one where, where we were able to see this again. So I think this was, this is a case where it was useful. So what happened was we had a patient who had, a, she had a Broca's lesion, expressive aphasia. She couldn't really initiate much speech, but she understood very well she could read 
again, we I can't show all that data, we, though we do have it. And we and so there was a famous test, uh, you know, last century, where basically could you order a uh, basically a pizza half uh, plain half pepperoni and a two liter bottle of coke over the phone without anyone watching you. And so we got our menu. If you know Green Kitchen has the menu is about 40 pages. I brought that menu and said, order something. She was on her cell phone. We're on ours. She couldn't see us. And she ordered. She said, I want a hamburger with uh, lettuce, tomato. And that was all in the menu. She read it. I thought, great. Perfect. This has really never been done before. We're going to a meeting. Someone will pay for it. Not me. It's fantastic. Okay. At which point, the speech therapy student, I think that maybe said, said, how do you want your, your hamburger cooked? I was like, shut up. She said, the patient just did this. It's never happened before. And the patient goes extremely rare. Like the basketball coach is like, don't shoot, don't shoot, good shot, okay? Or did you call glass? So, so I, that was really fascinating, and that was not on the menu. And I realized that was like queued up somehow. She goes to restaurants, people say, how do you want your thing cooked, your meat cooked? And she says, extremely right. I did go back and verify she did not like well, well, uh, you know, well done food. So that this was this was really quite a shock, okay, to us. And we um, presented it at uh, the AP, the Association of Academic Design Training 2023. This was really kind of exciting because this was beyond just counting or sequencing, which could be quote unquote overlearned, which I don't actually know what that means. Um, but this was this is really quite quite an exciting finding. And we've been seeing again case nothing ever rebel case in medicine. Nothing. But every patient we sort of we, we were seeing this. Um, we had another case at this meeting was in the in the fall of 2023 with um, I guess Bruno made this slide too. Okay, but then Nick is there. Okay, Aprova Chopad one of our residents. Andrew Dagnu also one of our residents. And and I have to say, uh, the italic sorry is for uh, EJ Villamore is one of our great speech therapists at Metropolitan. So that's the bold out. Now Jessica say uh, Julian Sage actually is in is a Toro uh, was is is now a Toro speech therapy graduate uh, graduate of speech therapy programs, and she was really key in this. She's up at the front there, and and, and we we were into this, and and she started. I said queuing, I, you know, talked to, talked about it a lot. Okay. And then she started, started trying patients on, she actually started antonyms. You say up and they say down. These are basic brokers. They, they really can't initiate speech, but when you gave them antonyms, uh, they could do it uh, pretty, very quickly and quite reliably. Synonyms, they could not. Okay. They were really flummoxed and really couldn't do it. Um, and so now I, I, I took this fit in with my, Worldview of things again, you're cute. Somehow up cues down. If you watch twenty thousand dollar pyramid, antonyms are very or opposites are very powerful cues. Okay, not tall but short. Okay, synonyms are going to be harder because you have to generate, it, and that's what Broca's area does. And the, the uh, forgive the professor professorial thing here, but the exception proves rule. We said um, we said sick, and it, we said sick, and I guess the antonym was well. She said tired. So like the phrase sick and tired. Now that was like a hot that I still could incorporate. The theory still fits that. Okay. Theory fits everything. No, but the theory, theory, theory still fits that because, aha, okay, sick and tired. It's queued up. So, so now we're thinking, hey, this queuing thing is pretty good. It appears to be we could queue arbitrary stuff. This is very exciting here. This was fantastic. Okay, so we got another case. We just came back from uh, Orlando to present it. And JB Koo, he obviously made this slide. Okay, he did. And um, and then uh, and then Nick again. And Nick's, Nick, Nick's on all these things. I don't know how. Okay, EJ, it should be italic. She's our therapist. She's on there too. And then Sunny Sunny Chi she is is, is NYMC uh, current NYMC uh, MS4. So we had another patient. Now now we're getting into it here. Okay, we realize the the whole trick is you 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 have to cue people basically. You have to find the right cue. That's the whole game, so to speak. The dictionary cues, and I'm going to show some data on this. And we have data. And this there's a paper based on this at review now currently. Dictionary cues don't don't really work very well. And I'm, I'm going to give a, a few brief examples why. But the whole game then becomes coming up with these prompts. Uh, and you say, aha, wait a second, that's, that's at, the, at the core, that's what these large language models do. They come up with prompts. So then we, okay, we're making the prompts. So, so now, now we're really into it. Okay. So, uh, and so let me just briefly go through this case. A uh, 65-year-old male um, had a stroke. I won't go through all the, all the details. You could actually, our abstract is online and going to be published in the abstract book. Hopefully the paper will be accepted. Um, and this is, the, this is the image here. You know, if you're not familiar, right is left, left is right. But this is basically a left frontal lesion. This is a Broca's lesion. This is a T2 weight MRI. Um, and, and let me just again review this, this diagram. So it's, it's really, it's a small, it's just Broca's is affected. They, they, the patient 55B was spared. So they could, they could articulate. And that's like the reporter. You could repeat, you could sequence. They, 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 they could articulate. Um, so that's how you know it's not damaged. You can also sort of um, squint at the at the MRI. With, or maybe the, at this point, the AI will tell you what that MRI said. Um, okay, I still go by regular intelligence. Anyway, okay, so just 
a review again. We're about to get the app. So broke is very left frontal. It does propositional speech. It kind of it gets things going basically. Okay, and that's the big thing. And then left prefrontal. That's sort of a little more posterior or um, it's rostral. Sorry, caudal. Um, it's speech articulation. It controls speech articulation when it's damaged. It ca it causes what's called uh, it's apraxia of speech. And of course, Wernicke's area is left temporal. Posterior, it's comprehension, reading, sequencing. It does all these things. So, um, so you realize, like, Wernicke's does all these things. I'm going to get to that, but wait a second. So, you know, Michael Dell just retired as the, the chief of um, PM&R, the service at, at Cornell. He said, patients don't want rehab. They want to be un, unstroke, right? So the game here, then, if you're, he's not, he does some research, but if you research the game, is you, you know, kind of use what you have. So the Wernicke's really does a lot. This is some of the data we have. So what we did is, I, hopefully you can see this a little bit. We did is, we tested the patient, and we compared the standard descriptive cues. We got the book out from the speech therapy, and then we compared that to, G, uh, we used BARD for this one, because um, it was free. Um, and so um, the large language molecule, and, and this patient, pretty severe, was only able to get about 18% of, of, of the words uh, with the dictionary cues, and, but another 22%, so twice as many again, with uh, more with the large language model cues. And we've heard about black boxes. Um, you know, I, my name means old school. So I, I kind of like the 19th century. I like having the rules. Okay, so I, I think we, we do know the rules. Um, and what we found is, for example, end of sentence is when, when the word you want comes at the end, you can generally get it. Call 911 in case of they'll say emergency. Okay, whereas if you have like a blank in a coal mine, you're, you're just not, we couldn't get canary. We've tried this on a bunch of people, you can't. Um, so th that's a very powerful cue, not a smile. Antonyms, of course, not a smile, but a frown. Those are powerful cues, I would say. And for example, again, like rhyming is not. So we say begins with letter C and rhymes with antelope, a fruit. You can't get cantaloupe. Why? Because again, it's propositional. You need your brokers there. You just can't do it, basically. That's a, that's a short summary of a lot of issues. Basically, end of sentence is a very powerful cue. Um, and then antonyms and opposites are, are the other super powerful cue. Um, and again, so with the large language, so we gave him first the the cue of the um, of the, the standard uh, of the dictionary cue, basically. Could, and then and then he got twice. He got another. He got eighteen percent. So and then he got eight out of forty five. And then he got ten out of another ten when, when we add the large language cue. Now even when he had both, he didn't get more. So it wasn't just that the large uh, that the language model came second. And, and if someone, we, I can talk about that later, but, but it was, it's, it's the cues themselves. It's not just going second. Okay. And then we said, well, we want to do a functional task. So we were looking about food ordering, uh, ordering um, items of clothing and furniture. And he was better, interestingly better on this and like a large, an app can remember this. Um, but he was, um, and so he was, he was pretty good at the furniture, even better on food. But again, even, you know, even ones where, but there were some where he couldn't get it. And then, and then we, we added a large language cue and he was able to get it. For example, um, television, we said to be glued to, and he said television, okay. Or oats, we said, so you're wild. And he said, oats. Now that's not really, there's nothing, you know, sewing doesn't really have to uh, do with oats. So, so it's interesting. These are, these are sort of just, you know, almost clang associations. Okay. One of the most powerful is if you say, if you say to someone, tell me what's a, a plot of land with uh, flowers and, and plants and, they, they, they won't really say anything. If you say mass and square, they're going to say garden, okay? And of course, the garden is it's an oval. It's not a square. There are no plants there. And by the way, this is the fourth building to have that name. It's at 33rd Street. No building of that name has been at Madison Square Park was on 26th Street in over 100 years. So it's a total clang association, but it's a very powerful one. Um, so again, this is just one patient. We've had others. Um, the language model, really, it, it's really quite helpful. And, and, and as I say, again, if you look at this diagram, the trick is, the Wernicke's is preserved if they can talk, if they can articulate, so is 55B. So what you want to do is use Wernicke's to, to, to get them to talk. It's like if they if they have a, a bad leg from a stroke or something, you know, they use the, the cane, that they use their arm to kind of substitute even the leg. You, you haven't fixed that leg or the stroke, but but they can walk. And we want to use Wernicke's. It's basically pseudo, pseudo propositional speech to get them to be able to talk. That, that, that's the goal. We've made an app for this. Um, let me see here. So, yeah, so the idea is Wernicke's can do a lot of this stuff all by itself. That's pretty cool. You don't need brokers. Uh, it's the prompting, and the app can provide that. And um, yes, and this is this is this is the way to the app. And I, I just like to say that yes. So so, and in terms of equity and inclusion, the app speaks every language. It's also always with you. Okay, you don't even even if you're rich and you have people, you don't want your family with you all the time. You don't want someone with you. No, no, this helps everybody. Okay, every single person. Okay, and the language is a big deal. It's a big deal. So um, it's very important. 
Okay, so I just like to say that yes, and so then I've got colleagues on this. I'm working with Beth uh, McCauley's PhD and speech therapist, um, Grand Valley State University in Michigan, and also Mehmet uh, goes in the mall. He actually made all the figures for my Bach book. Bach would have loved to have this guy as a copyist and student, but uh, he's he's a, a master's student in uh, in Switzerland uh, electronic music. He made he made the app, which is incredible. Also, he made the video, and um, it's it's a great video. This is I'm, I'm going to show you now a video of the app. Uh, it's two minutes. I'll close that. Let me see. Let me see if I can escape here. Yes, and I go to the cone, and then let's see. We're gonna. I hit play. Introducing SpeakEase, a groundbreaking app designed to empower those with expressive aphasia to navigate food menus with ease and independence. Start by simply uploading a photo of the menu or taking a picture directly through the app. Our intelligent app instantly converts your menu photo into an analyzable format, recognizing and categorizing each item flawlessly. Using advanced text recognition, each menu item is meticulously analyzed, communicating with the GPT-4 API for a detailed understanding. For each item, the app creates engaging sentences, synonyms, antonyms, so you took and a more, picture of transforming any, them any into speech menu. easy listening. And this is the, the app, app is also working. also creates images with doll E for each menu item that does not have an image. Navigate through the menu with ease using special category so buttons pictures and clickable were not items designed for those the with aphasia. Interact with menu items in two ways. First, click to enlarge the image. Clicking anywhere outside the image will close the image window. The second interaction method is clicking on the speaker icon next to each menu item to get audio cues. There are five different audio cues for each menu. On the sixth click, the first cue is played again. First click. I was craving something savory rolled into a perfect sphere and smothered in tomato sauce. Second click. It is beef, round, saucy, Italian. Third click. Opposite words, flat, dry, sweet, unseasoned. Fourth click. Spice up your. Fifth click. The name is Meatballs. Your menus are saved and organized for future use, ensuring a familiar and hassle-free experience each time. At SpeakEase, we're committed to continuous enhancement. With each use, SpeakEase gets better, adapting to serve you a more personalized experience. SpeakEase. Savor the conversation, not just the meal. Introducing SpeakEase, a groundbreaking app design. All right. So, all right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for another wonderful talk. Very fascinating. Very fascinating. So you can see there's lots of work being done in AI and lots of different realms. Uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is actually remote. Um, so I always say when you do a hybrid conference, you have to have at least one speaker uh, not in the room. So it could be truly uh, hybrid and really equitable. So uh, Dr. Roxana Danaju, she studied bioengineering at Rice University before matriculating to Stanford School of Medicine, where she completed her MD and a PhD in genetics with Dr. Russ Altman as part of the medical scientist training program. She completed dermatology residency at Stanford as part of the research track and completed a postdoc in biomedical data science with Dr. James Zhao. She currently is the assistant director of the Center of Excellence for Precision Health and Pharmacogenomics, director of informatics for the Stanford Skin Innovation and Interventional Research Group, a founding member of the Translational AI in Dermatology Training Group, and a faculty affiliate of Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and the AI in Medicine and Imaging Centers. I also had the privilege of getting to know Dr. Danaju uh, as we were both part of the, uh, uh, the Op-Ed Project Public Voices Fellowship over the past year. So I'm really, really excited to have her join us and I will now yield the floor to Dr. Danaju. Thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm very happy to be here um, remotely. I love, um, I would have loved to be there in person. I have a 12 week old, so that makes it a little hard. Um, so today I'll be talking about some of the work that I've done looking at AI in medicine and whether it um, could help potentially close the gap in disparities or increase disparities. Um, just by way of background, I spend about 80 to 90% of my time uh, working in my research lab, which works in the AI space. And then the other um, percentage of my time is providing clinical care at Stanford as a dermatologist. So I do have some disclosures. Um, there is no direct relation to any of the work that I will be discussing uh, today. 
So I always like to begin every talk about AI because as was discussed earlier um, in the session, AI is really building upon knowledge and data that already exists. And in our healthcare system, we have structural racism that is causing healthcare disparities continuously. And so the fact of the matter is, is I see a lot of people talking about technological solutions to help close disparity gaps. And while I do think that technology has a role to play, we cannot address the health disparities that exist without addressing the racism in medicine. So there's not a magic, you know, wand called AI that you can wave over medicine, as some people may believe, that is going to fix all of our problems. And I mean, I think this audience um, is, is this idea is not surprising to them, but, you know, many in the house of medicine need to hear this still, that if we don't clean up in-house with the structural racism that exists in medicine, in our society, that impacts everything from access to care to opportunities to you know financial opportunities we are not going to be able to fix you know these problems that we have um just by bringing in some shiny new technology um so i i know we've this has kind of been discussed already so i won't belabor the point but AI algorithms really learn from data. Um, if the data is labeled, it's called supervised learning. It can also learn from unlabeled data by kind of seeing patterns that exist without labels. That's called unsupervised learning. But a lot of things that is being done in medicine is more supervised learning. And the idea is, so this is a picture of my daughter actually right before the pandemic, she's now five. But I always say like, you can think about it, about how you kind of teach children about how to identify animals. They don't come into that task completely naive. Um, I have a 12 week old right now. He's looking at the world all the time. In his brain, he's learning things about shapes and colors and textures. Um, and so when it comes time for him to learn animals, he brings that knowledge. And that's what a lot of, uh, for computer vision at least, that's what a lot of pre-training is, is that you pre-train on these large corpuses of like hundreds of thousands of images, millions of images. Um, that so, so for example, with my daughter, you know, we sh show her this and we say, this is a dog. And we show her this and she says, oh, that's a dog too. We say, no, 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 that's incorrect. That's a cat. So she starts to kind of figure out in her mind, what are the features that are associated with the dog? What are the features that are associated with the cat? Um, obviously the four legs doesn't really help with discrimination. Um, maybe it's something about the shape of the face or the whiskers. Um, and so, you know, she sees this and says, oh, that's a dog. And then we tell her, no, that's a cat. So she makes little adjustments in her brain. And that's a lot of what these AI algorithms are doing. They see examples and they begin to learn important features of images um, in computer vision that allow them to discriminate between animals. And, you know, with a human child, they see enough examples, they begin to develop this idea of how to be able to discriminate between animals. And so a similar kind of process happens using basically uh, basically a lot of mathematics, which I'm not going to jump into today, but um, there's a lot of great resources on the internet. So in healthcare, when we're building these models, what often happens is we take, you know, we have some tasks we want to do. And since I'm a dermatologist, I'll just say like, you know, um, identifying melanoma, which is a deadly skin cancer. So what you might do is you might take a bunch of image examples of melanomas and benign nevi um, and train this model. So a bunch of retrospective images, train this model and then evaluate it on another set of melanoma and nevi retrospective images. And then from there, if you're happy with how the model does, you might do some kind of prospective trial, deploy it, assess the impact, assess if it's working as well. The issue is, as I've mentioned, 
this is a very data hungry process. And if you put bias data in, you are going to get a bias model out. That is not so different than humans, um, you know, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit in, later. But basically, you know, that's an important concept that I want people to hold on to as we go on in this talk. Now, as a dermatologist, I've heard many times AI could help improve access. I don't know if anyone in the room has tried to see a dermatologist. We're in the United States. And even in the United States, it can take months to get in to access dermatological care. Not to mention that there are many parts of the country where there isn't access to dermatolo dermatology care. And then globally, you have 3 billion people who have no access. To dermatology care. And so because dermatology is a very visual field, it's always been thought that, okay, we can use computer vision, AI, to be able to um, triage patients, to be able to diagnose patients. And indeed, there has been tech companies that have made claims about being able to diagnose disease as good as dermatologists. A lot of this stuff doesn't necessarily hold up in trials. Um, However, one concern that I've had is whether or not these models are really are really um, made for everybody, essentially. Because in dermatology, as I mentioned before, when you think about building these models, what are the biases that exist in the field in general? Dermatology is one of the least diverse medical fields. Not only that, there have been studies published on the fact that our textbooks do not reflect the diversity of our patients and that residents um, don't always necessarily get the best training. And if you haven't watched it yet, I highly recommend Dr. Jenna Lester's TED Talk. Um, she is a dermatologist and the director of the Skin of Color Clinic at UCSF, where she talks about this issue in edu dermatological education and the impact on our patients. Now she is a colleague and good friend. And so my thinking was that this issue exists within our field of dermatology. And the fear is that it could get translated into our AI systems. And so um, a couple years ago, we actually went through and went through all the dermatology AI papers that were out there, looked at 70 papers to assess the uh, potential biases in that data. Now, one thing we found is that most of the data was siloed, which is not surprising um, given you know issues around patient privacy, but also is something that's certainly true for all of medical AI. Here, every purple square represents a paper, every circle represents a data set, the red circles means that I cannot look at the data that was used to um, to build the model. I cannot, you know, access the images. I cannot assess them to see. And so you'll see that there's only a few green circles. Number one is one of the biggest data sets. That's the International Skin Imaging Collaboration um, data set. And so that data set has over a hundred thousand images from multiple sites, both in the US, Europe, beyond. Um, it's mostly these zoomed in dermoscopic photos, so zoomed in magnified. But the problem is, is that almost every single image is on white skin. And in fact, when we look at AI data sets in dermatology in general, we find that for most of the models, there is no description of what ethnicity or skin tone was used to train the test in the models. And for the small number that does, the 10% were they of papers that did describe the skin tones, they either excluded or significantly underrepresented brown and black skin. So um, in dermatology, we use the Fitzpatrick skin tone scale. That scale by itself is quite biased because they initially excluded brown and black skin and later added it on and it doesn't perfectly encapsulate the full range of diversity of human skin tones. However, um, that is how a lot of clinical data is labeled. So we had to work with what we had. 
what we did is we actually built a data set um, that we de-identified. We built this data set of, of images of skin disease that was balanced across a uh, skin tone and had matching of disease, uh, patient sex, patient um, age, time of photography. So we created this match data set so that we could be able to test models and see how they perform. Um, and what we found is that we looked at three different previously published models that had state-of-the-art performance and the red line is bad. So the closer you are to the red line, the worse you are. The interesting thing is, is that all of these models, you uh, you know, perfect performance is a uh, area under the receiver operator curve of one. So all of these models in their original papers had something like a 0.9 or better performance, a so really great performance. All the models do worse on our data set to begin with. But the most concerning part is that they do significantly worse at identifying cutaneous malignancies and skin cancers on brown and black Fitzpatrick five and six skin compared to Fitzpatrick one and two. And the reason for this is that because these algorithms were not trained on diverse data sets. And so um, they don't learn what skin cancer looks like across diverse skin tones. And we wanted to show that the issue was the lack of diversity in the data. So we actually took one of the models and we took a portion of their, our data set and did something called fine tuning, which is where you can update the model by showing it additional examples. And so we actually sh showed it diverse image data. And what we found is that if we only showed it images of Fitzpatrick one and two, so only white skin, there is some boost in model performance. That's because these models are sensitive to other things like lighting changes between sites or um, you know, just even like if your distribution of patient ages are different. So they're very sen these models can be very sensitive to all sorts of extraneous things. However, it doesn't close the gap if you only show it more images of disease on white skin. The only way to close the gap in performance for these skin AI models is to actually have it see diverse data. Again, bringing home the point that the you know we have solutions to the problem. We don't have to have AI models that work poorly across different groups. If we have inclusive data to start with, we can build models that can perform well across everybody. Um, I have to say, a word, so that was more computer vision. I do have to put a word in on language models because it's the hot thing right now. Um, and because my group did some early work in biases in language models. So I think everyone here has heard of ChatGPT, has heard of the chatbots that have been created. And the fact of the matter is, I'll be honest, I have never seen a technology move so quickly to try to be deployed in the medical realm without additional testing the way that things are happening with AI. I mean, there's already relationships between Epic and Microsoft, Google, and large healthcare systems. And so one of the things, as was mentioned before, was that these models are trained on large amounts of text data. And if you remember the beginning, as I mentioned, this is data hungry. And if you put biased data in, you're going to get biases out. These models are not necessarily trained to be accurate or correct. There is um, something called um, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, where the models are uh, given additional information by humans who kind of grade whether or not a response is appropriate. But for the largest uh, part, when these models are trained, the, the majority, the bulk of the training is just kind of a fancy autocomplete being able to probabilistically say what's the next best word. And so the issue is, is that there's a lot of medical literature right now that has incorrect race-based medicine, because as we know, race is a social construct with no biological validity. And yet it's been used in a biological way in medicine to the harm of 
groups that have faced, you know, disparities for the longest time. So we asked four different models, a list of questions that we had gotten from a previous PNAS paper that looked at the false race-based beliefs of medical trainees and from questions like things around EGFR kidney function, um, lung capacity. And we found all of the models gave incorrect race-based answers. And the most concerning part is that some of the models, such as ChatGPT, actually gave debunked racist tropes to try to explain why. So for example, on kidney function, it gave the erroneous racist idea of, oh, you have to use race because there's different in mus differences in muscle mass between the races, which is not something that is true. So, you know, our group has concerns about how some of this information that is incorrect, debunked, and racist could get into the models and then uh, be then regurgitated to the human physicians who may erroneously already believe some of those things and not be aware. Um, in terms of thinking of how we could fix this, my group and I have discussed like how nice would it be if the model actually did the opposite where it said, hey, there's a new equation that doesn't use race. And these are the reasons that it's not valid to use race. And this is these are the reasons that race is not biological. You know, you could imagine a world where these models actually help and try to um, get rid of race-based medicine rather than perpetuating it. So my takeaways are that AI is already entering medicine. Um, so we have to all be aware it's not going away. And that data set and model bias is a real problem. And it's really up to us to address it now without letting things get any further. Terrific, thank you so much. Excellent, excellent talk. Uh, yes, very excellent talk, uh, Dr. Danescu. This is for the dermatologist. Do you have any um, uh, assessment on how the use of synthetic data in <clears throat> closing the disparity gap in terms of improvement in uh, performance? We use um, synthetic data. Yeah, so that's a great question that's been discussed many times. And actually, we have a preprint out. Um, the title of which I I'm going to try to Google it. It's actually under review right now. And what we find, so my concern was basically that that people want to use real data for white skin images and synthetic data for brown and black skin images. And that already is causing a disparity gap, right? Because that means you have a group of people who are having real images used and a group of people where we're not taking the time to go collect the real images, but using synthetic data. And so we have a preprint out, which basically shows that synthetic data does can improve the, mod, the gap performance, but not as much as real data does. And so while synthetic, you know, data could, you know, move the needle a bit, real data is the actual king. And so um, you end up having, so if you have a situation where white skin images are 100% real and brown and black skin is like, you know, 70% real and 30% synthetic, sure, it can help close a bit of the gap, but then you still have a gap that exists because you're not using real images. So real images... We have to do the work. It can't just be, you know, using synthetic data. Excellent. And any 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 other questions for those three panelists? There was actually a question for the first panel. Uh, somebody asked from the virtual world, are the hospitals using the AI for billing and coding? Anybody have answer to that? Uh, the answer is yes, so for some of it. You wanna... uh, I was fascinated by your con some comment regarding the fact that we could maybe see how much AI is being used in the chart, but we are proactively using natural language processing, which reads the charts every night, and we do some AI connected to that, but the coding right now is with no AI at all. 
at least at Westchester. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any questions for the for the last this last panel? We'll, we'll take one last question and we're going to move on. Um, I have a question for a dermatologist. Um, so with all these advancements and in, 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 in with AI and stuff, um, and with just like the whole the, the the general idea that we trust technology and we think everything from technology is like correct a hundred percent. Um, and with all these dis disparities, um, that we're starting to notice, um, do you think that, uh, it's kind of like you, I do, do you kind of feel scared that, um, that we're going to kind of attribute racism to the fact that like, this is technology. So technology always knows best. So like, will, will we get to, a t do you think I'm kind of like going to be regressing and getting to going back to the time where it's like, there's, there's fact, there's a fact that, you know, this is, this race is better than this race just because of like the fact that technology was like supposed to be like what we trust. So I think that these concerns are valid and um, me and other dermatologists have been raising our voice saying at least, you know, even in places, domains like the FDA that, Hey, we cannot allow technologies to get approved if they haven't been tested. Like for dermatology, AI do not approve technologies that are, you know, leaving out a whole segment of the population so that they end up causing increased health disparities. Um, I think that in the field of dermatology in general, there's actually a lot of distrust of AI for different reasons because they're scared of getting having their jobs replaced, which we're nowhere near hap that happening. And so there's been actually, even with companies, a push towards more decision support um, because the technologies are not perfect, meaning that the models um, provide uh, provide support to the physician and the physician makes uh, the ultimate decision. We actually had a paper just published in Nature Medicine um, where we did a kind of an experiment where we gave a fair AI algorithm. We, we made it be fair um, to physicians to use as decision support. And it turns out that one, this won't surprise anyone. The physicians did worse diagnosing on brown and black skin. So at baseline, there's the disparity. And then when we even when we give them a fair model, for some reason, they trust the model more on, um, you know, white skin. We tell them it's a fair model, but they trust the model more on white skin. And so even though the mo giving them that decision support improves their performance on both brown and black and white skin, the disparity gap actually increases um, because of the way that they trust the model. So my what my point there is that anything that we create, even if we think we've created a fair model, we cannot assess the impact of it without actually testing it in the healthcare system and making sure it doesn't make things worse for our patients. So at the end of the day, the most important thing is to assess impact on our patients and making sure that the impact is not um, causing increased disparity. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Denizhu, for zooming in from California, the Bay Area, and we're gonna get, we'll take a final round of applause. We're gonna have to move on now. And thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So now we have um, Dr. Lori Anderson, uh, is a board certified anatomic and clinical pathologist and fellow of the College of American Pathologists. She completed medical school at University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Residency in anatomic and clinical pathology was completed at Northwell Health. She went on to complete a surgical pathology fellowship at University of Southern California. She currently is chief of laboratory medicine at Good Sam Samaritan Hospital in Suffern, New York. She also serves as a medical staff officer at Good Sam Samaritan Hospital, a delegate for the College of American Pathologists, House of Delegates, and Vice President of Orange Pathology Associates. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Laurie Anderson. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here and talk about artificial intelligence in um, pathology, where it's pretty big right now. Um, and we also have um, some issues that I'll talk about later with job security when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, so I have no disclosure, as we saw before. So I'm gonna talk about the uses of AI and pathology. Some we're using now, um, some are on the horizon, 
and then some of the issues with it um, and kind of our future. So artificial intelligence and pathology holds great promise in advancing our fundamental knowledge about disease processes that are so critical to cancer progression, chronic disease evolution, and infectious disease management. Um, advancing science through deeper interrogation of both anatomic and clinical pathology data holds great promise in significantly improving our understanding of human disease that's so critical to our advancement in our discipline in pathology. So I couldn't do this lecture without some pathology because we have to. So if you look here, this is actually um, a lung specimen, um, but you can see in the center, there is a tumor. And if we go higher power, we can see this, um, these atypical cells forming these kind of um, Asner kind of patterns. Um, and here, higher power, we can see the atypia. Um, so this is actually a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor. And the reason I use this one and the next one, so we'll go into the next one. Well, okay, so the, the WHO classifies neuroendocrine tumors um, in different ways, but one of the important ways is mitotic rate. And so we can either use the mitotic rate or the KI-67 proliferative index. And these are things that um, tell us whether this has a potential for aggressive behavior. So these are like our neoplasms of undetermined significance or, or undetermined behavior. So mitotic rate is a good way to see what, how this tumor is gonna behave. So we sit at our microscope and we count mitoses and we'll count in 10 fields how many we see. So we have, they actually have, um, ways in which we can't count certain mitoses and things like that. So it's not an easy process and it's a time consuming process. So this tumor, so we can see these spindle cells, nice pink cytoplasm. You can see some conspicuous nucleoli, higher power. I did this one to show you some mitotic figures there. So we have two in this or two or three in this field. Um, and this is a gastrointestinal stromal tumor or a GIST. And like the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, these gists, their predictive of, malign of their malignant behavior is not only their size, but also their mitotic rate. So again, we're seeing mitotic rate come up. And so we have to sit at our microscope and count mitoses for these diseases. So we use AI for this now already, so we can, use digital pathology. We can load these slides into a digital um, imager and we can get, it can record how many mitotic figures in so many high power fields. So also the KI-67 proliferative index is an amyohistochemical stain that we can use that gives us a proliferation index. So we can use AI for that as well. There's other ways as well, PDL one which any oncologist out there would know we use that um, for therapies, immunotherapies to help patients with um, different malignancies. So AI can recognize all of these mitotic figures that I sit and look at all day. Um, it could take me probably about 30 minutes just looking in for mitotic figures a day. So we can automate this and they have um, it's going to increase our accuracy, our efficiency. It allows us to do other things, right? So we're doing, you know, synoptic summaries for cancer diagnoses and things like that. And so we can spend our time doing those things and the computer can spend its time counting mitotic figures. So this is an example of KI-67. At the bottom is what we see in our microscope. And so this can be um, automated and much faster and much more accurate if we use AI. This is the CPS score. This is um, PDL1. Um, so you can use AI to help you with this as well. So one way we can use AI that really is it's it's very interesting is 
in pathology, we have an issue of tissue floaters. And I can actually show you. So this is an example of a tissue floater. And I just had this the other day. So I took a photo really quick for you guys. But this was a breast case. So you see fat. And then up at the top, you see this spindly kind of um, tissue at the top of the slide that doesn't belong there. And I know it doesn't belong there because it's not fat and it's not um, duct for the breast. So AI can actually help with this. But so floaters come from a, a many different areas in the pathology lab. So it's actually a contaminant on the slide. It's not present in the tissue block. You can see the tissue block down here in the corner. It's not in the block usually. It's usually during the processing. So you can see up at the top, that's a water bath. That's where the slides, they actually take this block, cut a thin layer, and then put it on the slide is what you see at the top. Well, you can get some tissue from other places in that water bath, and that'll end up on the slide. So it poses a lot of challenges because sometimes it's not so different than what you saw there, right? So sometimes we're looking at these slides and you think, oh no, is this tumor from, does this patient have this tumor or is this from someone else or from some other specimen? So they're using AI in a very interesting way. So centers that use digital pathology, they may load all of their slides digitally into their um, hubs. Well, you can use an image search tool that will go through all of those cases very quickly to see how, where that tissue matches. So we know that there's a case somewhere where that tissue came from and it can scan it and find it very quickly. So, because what I do is I have to say, okay, what was gross before? What was gross after? What was cut before? What was cut after to try to figure out where this tissue came from? It takes a lot of time, but we can use AI to quickly go through all the cases and figure out where that, where that tissue came from. So in pathology, we can use um, AI to improve our turnaround time. And I just told you a million ways in which we can improve our turnaround time. Um, but there's also a big, you know, pathologists kind of stay in their lanes a little bit. So if we don't know something, we send it out for a consult. Well, we could do that digitally and then it's much faster. And what could take five days with mailing and returning the slides and things like that could take a day. So it improves turnaround time for patients. But also there are niche areas of pathology where there aren't that many pathologists that do, let's say renal pathology. We have centers where there are people who do it, but I'm a community pathologist. I never look at kidneys unless there's a tumor there. So medical kidney usually goes to a center. Well, we can start using, and they're testing this now, we can start using AI to help us, especially in areas where, there, where we don't have access to care, we can use digital pathology and AI to help us with those renal biopsies. Big place they're using AI is in prostate pathology. So prostate cancers, um, they're, you can see here this schematic. This is this is the Gleason scoring, and when we talk about Gleason scoring, we know that pathologists don't always agree on it. So what I say may be a three, someone else may call a four, and these all have implications in treatment of patients. So there's a lot of inter-observer variability in pathology in Gleason scoring. Um, we can combine all of our data. So I'm in the clinical lab as well, looking at PSA levels. Um, there's MRI guided biopsies. There are genomic biomarkers that now we're sending out on prostate cancers, Gleason grading. We can use all of this to risk stratify our patients and help with follow-up. So this can all be done with AI and they're doing it. And so we can combine all of this data and it'll give us um, reduce the subjectivity of 
sometimes that you can get um, with uh, physicians, you'll use fewer resources, and you can improve your overall efficiency and accuracy in cancer diagnosis and management. So I won't go into this so much because we talked about the artificial neural networks, um, but they've actually used, there was a study that evaluated the capacity of these ANNs to assess prostate biopsies based on the presence, extent, and Gleason grade in malignant tissue. And their results were similar to um, the accuracy of urologic pathologists. So we can use this in cancer diagnosis and treatment. We can use all this data together to help us with patient prog prognostic prognostication. Pandemic prevention. This is one way I'm the one in the lab getting all the viral results. So we can use this data to early identify pandemics. Pathology residency training. We can assist residents in training by making it much easier. We have, physicians have, we all don't have that much time. So in order to train residents, this is a way that we can assist them in training. It helps with time management for attendings. Drug treatments, and this is, so there's, there's a segment of pathology called companion diagnostics. And there are companies like Roche, which used to be Ventana, they combined. Um, they're combining with these companies. So like Path AI and Roche have combined recently to create an AI-enabled digital, digital pathology algorithm for companion diagnostics. Companion diagnostics is how we get, you know, drug specific to certain tumors. So we can use this and they're using this um, to address the limitations in our current companion diagnostic assays. And so we can improve the accuracy of our genetic and tissue-based biomarkers and treat cancers better. So this is just a schematic of how, how much we're doing in pathology with AI. So there's diagnostic applications, there's predictive and prognostic applications. We're using it for molecular and genomic profiling in our residency and research, and then in our drug discovery and development. So some of the pitfalls. So we talked about the intra-observer variability in prostate cancer and Gleason scoring. This is actually just part of, uh, of our field and, and how much variability we can have, but AI is taught by the experts, right? So we have, the best urologic pathologists reading these slides and teaching the AI what the Gleason score is. But remember, I said that there's a lot of inter-observer variability in us. So now we're teaching that variability to the AI. So you're still gonna have that, right? So the fact that they're human taught is, all, is an issue. So something that we'd have to think about and when you talk about whether or not this would replace us looking at the glass, I'm not sure it would. We'd still have to look at the glass. AI systems are highly complex, but they're often nonlinear, they show nonlinear performance. So you have to have a thorough analytic and clinical validation prior to it being implemented. And then once it's implemented, we have to monitor it. And there has to be somebody to do that. Your health systems have to have expertise in AI. You think about that, I'm in a small community hospital. Would we have that? Would we have someone to critically review the vendor's validation and verification materials? Would they have that in Iowa in a small town somewhere? Um, and then, once it's once we have that validation, then we have to test that validation. We do this a lot in the lab. The lab is all about validation. So this takes time. Another issue with AI is that it's not all the same. So the performance rates are all different. So 
not only that, digital pathology, the industry, although I say we're, we're using it, we're doing digital pathology, it's fragmented. There's so many different software, um, hardware and algorithm provide, providers that it's really prevented it from really blowing up in our field. And I think there are a lot of pathologists who are very resistant to the change. And of course, ethics of cost and availability are huge here because it is expensive and not all health systems can afford it and afford to have the, um, the staff to keep it going. I said, it has to be validated. You have to do post-implementation validations. You have to check on those validations. So do we have the money in these small hospitals to do this? And like it was said before, so we see this, but what about the erroneous or misleading results that we can get from AI? And will we become so dependent on it that we won't see them? So this is one of the issues we may have is that we're not going back, we're not looking, we're not, in, and we're losing those skills with that. So that's an important thing to think about as we move forward is can we look back and say, okay, this is a potential problem. And can we identify those problems with AI and not have patients actually have misdiagnoses due to we've missed it on our AI? One of the big problems is in pathology is data breaches. We have, if we keep all of the slides digitally tracked, and somebody breaches that, we'd have to deal with that as well. Um, pathologist skills. So we, that's, this is, this is my skill. I, I look at slides all day. So if the computer's looking at the slides all day, am I gonna lose those skills? Very important because when we're training pathologists, will they learn these skills? What happens when it all goes out and we can't use it for a day? What are we gonna do? So this is something that we have to think about as well. We need to be able to see it still and will this train us to not see it? And lastly, our job market. So pathologists are very worried about this. This is our big thing is every hospital doesn't need, you know, 25 pathologists. Um, so there's not a lot of pathologists in a hospital anyway, even in community settings. So right now there's a shortage. There's a shortage in medicine overall. Um, and our job market's great right now, but with this, it may go down to, instead of needing five pathologists, you only need two because you have AI. So we'll have to address this when it comes up right? Because this might be an issue. So ultimately, AI is going to be great because we're going to have faster turnaround times. We're going to risk stratify patients better. We're going to have better treatments for cancer patients. We're going to be able to identify pandemics early. Um, hopefully, we could give equal care to all patients, regardless of their socioeconomic status. But will it make things tough for pathologists in the future? But I guess it's best to, best to embrace it because it's coming and see how we can make it work and how we can make it work for everyone. Because that's one of the issues is that cost in these small towns, we may not get them. So thank you so much. I appreciate yes. the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Terrific. Excellent. Excellent work. Yeah, this was a excellent talk. And I think a lot of the, obviously, a lot of the things you've covered apply to so many of our fields of medicine. Um, so we have to be very, very careful as we bring in these AI. I think now, hopefully, the audience is seeing that AI is not just, you know, just bring it right in and let it, let it take over. Um, you want to, you want to have some level of control. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Chantel Johnson. She's currently Pediatric Chief Resident at Maria Ferreri Children's Hospital. 
She has a passion for research and academic medicine with a focus on health disparities. She ignited her desire to serve underserved populations during her undergraduate career at Princeton University and continued her work during medical school at Howard University. During residency, she has been engaged in DEI-related research and presented her research at numerous national conferences discussing topics such as lack of representation in clinical trials, which we've heard about today that not having representation is leading to these AI models being uh, flawed. Uh, she served on the NYMC School of Medicine, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. She will continue her focus on diversity, equity, inclusion projects during her pediatric emergency medicine fellowship at Yale University. Um, as part of her leadership and academic medicine journey, Dr. Johnson is also a New Century Scholar and NIH NMA Fellow. She is a member at large on the National Chief Resident Executive Committee, as well as the Liaison Chair on the Underrepresented in Medicine Chief Collective. She has a strong interest in DEI uh, initiatives and lack of representation in AI and clinical trials. And I will say, uh, to my knowledge, she is the first resident to present at the Gila <laughs> Conference. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. Today I'll be discussing pediatric medicine in the age of AI. Unfortunately, I have no dis disclosure. Um, so today I'll be talking about goals and benefits of AI in pediatric medicine, along with the challenges and ethical considerations. Um, also the impact AI has on health and and also strategies to mitigate implicit bias in the use of AI in pediatric medicine. So where did AI come from? Let's talk about the history a little bit. So in 1925, there was actually a humanoid robot um, in a novel called Metropolis, and it was turned into a film. And so this is Robot Maria, um, the bottom left-hand corner. And then in 1939, you have the Tin Man, from Wizard of Oz, and a lot of people think that he was mirrored off of Maria. In the 1950s, if you had $200,000 a month to spare, you could lease a computer that looked like this one. In 1956, a lot of literature coins this as the beginning of AI as we know it. So Newell Shaw and Simon had logic theorist program that they presented at the Dartmouth College Artificial Intelligence Conference. And this type of AI was really designed to mimic problem solving skills of a human. In the 1960s at MIT, Weizenbaum had Eliza who interprets spoken language in an early natural language processing computer. So you really could just input questions and Eliza would answer them in a way that made sense. In the 1980s, we start to see a lot of movies around artificial intelligence. In 1984 was Terminator 1. I put Terminator 2 up here because this is the best Terminator film. In 1985, we start to see Back to the Future. And then in 1997 is where we see Gasparov defeated by IBM's Deep Blue. So you see the shock of the audience in this picture and him hanging his head in his hands for losing against a computer. So how does AI captivate curiosity? Let's explore the fascination behind artificial intelligence. So we really saw a lot of this increased emergency department burden, especially in pediatric hospitals. So there was lack of community access to health care, so decreased access to things like subspecialty care, outpatient care, pediatrician access. There's also lack of access to the medical home, such as telemedicine or mobile health access. Um, we also see vulnerable populations like Medicaid patients or patients without insurance who need the ER more often than other patients. And we also see increased ER burden when we see access barriers like financial, transportation, insurance access issues. So there's really a need for improved mental and behavioral health services, health coverage, medical education, outpatient services, as well as hours of operation. So if you're a family who relies on their income from their nine to five job, and your pediatrician's office is also open from nine to five, a lot of these patients also influx our ERs. And when I say pediatric emergency department burden, I really should say all emergency department burden, because about 80% of pediatric ER visits occur in non-children's hospitals. So really, this is everyone's problem. So this graph is from the CDC. It shows pre-COVID um, influx of emergency department visits among children zero to 17 years old. The star is where there's a declaration of the national emergency for the COVID pandemic. 
March of 2020, and now you see this, cleddy, this steady incline of pediatric presentations. Our, in our own backyard here at Maria Ferreri, this is our data. So we see this pre-pandemic um, total monthly number of pediatric patients in our own emergency department with this similar decline. But if you follow the trend line, we've now surpassed our pre-pandemic numbers. So we really see a lot of increased burden in our own emergency department. Some of these numbers can be due to certain types of injuries like drug poisoning, self-harm, firearm injuries, chronic diseases. We've also seen a huge influx of behavioral health and mental health issues to the point where the, the um, AP um, declared a national emergency in child and adolescent mental health. And so this graph on the bottom left just shows the difference in the influx of mental health and behavioral health patients in our ERs. So the bottom solid line is from 2019 and the top dotted line is from 2020. And so when we look at AI, we really try to have a positive lens. So what are some of the potentials and goals? So really the goals are to enhance patient care and improve efficiency. So we see this with accurate and timely diagnosis and overall better treatment and outcomes. And there's also a hope that automating some of these processes of these routine administrative tasks can alleviate some of the burden on our physicians. So the AMA actually surveyed physicians and asked what their view of AI was. And this survey was released in December of 2023 and showed that 54% of physicians were really eager to give AI some of their administrative burdens, including documentation and prior off submissions. Um, but the concern is that if we are using more AI, then are we decreasing the quality of the patient-physician relationship? And also, are we having issues with patient privacy? We're also hoping that there will be improvement in the accuracy and accessibility um, to basically treating our patients. And what's nice is that as a physician, you can utilize AI every day and not need any programming knowledge. So some things that AI does pretty well are image interpretation. So like interpreting x-rays, MRIs, CTs, ultrasounds, which can lead to early diagnosis. ADOC is one such example. And this program assists in identifying abnormalities such as intracranial hemorrhages and pediatric brain scans. I also love looking at the the advertisements for AI. So for ADOC, they say that they added $1 million in revenue. There are 2 million patients who are analyzed each month. We also see treatment personalization. So AI can use genetics, demographics, medical history, and really start to recommend personalized treatment plans. So IBM Watson for genomics uses the genetic profile. St. Jude Cloud's AI platform uses genomic data to predict treatment response. And foundation medicine uses genomic mutation data and really tries to aid in the development of targeted therapies. And all three of these AI platforms are used in oncology. And lastly, early detection. So early detection of diseases can lead to timely interventions and again, improved outcomes, which is one of our goals. So Cognoa and Tempest both use AI technology to try to detect pediatric developmental delays, and autism spectrum disorders. But there are issues with the AI. One of them is that we think computer systems and technology and AI um, are imperfect or are perfect. And so this is one example. So I put I input into the AI system. You can probably tell by the words on the screen what I input, and this is what it spit out. So to me, this is pretty simple. You can make up whatever images you want and you literally just have to regurgitate what I input into the system and this is what came up. So what are some of the issues? We have underrepresentation through multiple facets of AI. So one of them is data set bias. So minority populations are underrepresented, underrepresented not only in the data that we use and we input into these systems, but also in terms of the teams that are on these AI development teams. There's also lack of participation and patients and their families are hesitant to include their 
their data due to a multitude of reasons. Some of them include mistrust of the healthcare system, meta lack of medical and technological education. There may be cultural barriers. We also see prioritization of majority population data. So obviously, minority patients have decreased numbers in these um, data sets for the AI that we use every day. Pediatric patients are also among the minority. And in the minority population data, we, saw, we see increased um, errors with the data and decreased data quality. We also see electronic health records that are incomplete and have increased errors, especially among our minority patients. And lastly, there's lack of experiential learning. So especially in the pediatric population where their medical status is dependent on maybe it's the parenting, maybe it's developmental status, but all of these things are often changing. And so we need a way for either AI to learn from this quickly or a way for us to input data more quickly. There's also historical bias amplification, which we talked a lot about today. Um, AI models essentially potentiate systemic racism in healthcare models because we are the ones inputting the data. So if systemic racism exists in our society, it also exists in the AI that we use every day. So especially in the pediatric population, we see this with nutrition, asthma management, dermatology. For nutrition, we see that AI has trouble giving recommendations um, that are culturally competent. For asthma management, we see that AI has trouble factoring in social determinants of health, such as minority populations who have increased um, pollution in their societies. And obviously for dermatology, which we heard about, AI has trouble diagnosing pediatric patients and patients overall with darker skin tones. We also see issues with the UTI calculator, the GFR calculator, and the pulse oximity technology. We also see bias in the algorithms that we use, so what we're inputting into the system. So this study is a really good example of this. So what these authors did was they looked at algorithms that were used across multiple institutions. They took white and black patients who were rated with the same risk score. So essentially, they had the same level of illness according to this algorithm. What this group did is they examined the algorithm used and noted that this algorithm was used, this algorithm used, used um, healthcare costs as the proxy for health needs. And because black patients have fewer interactions with the healthcare system, it falsely concluded that black patients were healthier. So what they did instead was instead of using healthcare costs as the proxy, they used um, chronic illnesses as the proxy for health needs. And then that's how they created this graph on the left-hand side. And you see that separation between black and white patients. And so due to this, they, we saw a reduction in the number of black patients identified for extra care need by more than half, just in this alone. So closing the gap, how do we balance children's positive percep perception of AI with continued need for access and safety? So overall, we see in the literature and in real life that pediatric patients, young adults, love AI, love technology, interact with it constantly. So in this specific study, they took patients that were 10 to 18 years old. They examined the ethical use of AI using different vignettes. So they touched on topics such as trust, health data research, clinical trials, clinical use of AI. And overall, these patients had positive views and they were willing to discuss AI. They discussed that they had exposure to AI in school and at home, but just didn't use it in the clinical, con in the clinical context as much. Children in this study had concerns over consent to data use, so they were just worried that they wouldn't be asked to, do to use their data. And the parents of these children were concerned that the people asking for data would not be transparent about its use. And again, these are just some examples of the way that our children interact with AI. And so there are a lot of different groups who are trying to make AI more child-centered, safe, and ethical. So this is just a list um, from UNICEF and some of the partnerships that they have. 
So they touch on teaching concepts of fairness and non-discrimination. They have simulations that help you interact with children with autism spec spectrum disorder and other things. But there's also lack of access. So we see digital determinants of health um, and essentially the digital di divide that affects who has access to these technologies. So we also see limited telemedicine access. Even when people have access to telemedicine, we see poor language system interpretation and linguistic diversity. Pew Research Center also looked at home broadband access and noticed that 95% of adults who have an income of at least $100,000 per year um, had access to home broadband when only 57% of adults in households that make at least 30,000 or make $30,000 um, per year or less had access. And we see similar patterns with different levels of formal education along with race and ethnicity differences. And we also see geographic variation and infrastructure challenges in terms of inadequate internet connectivity, broadband limitations, and unreliable power supply. And we also need to touch on the ethical concerns. So there are concerns around breach of confidentiality and privacy. There's also a lack of appropriate regulation since use of AI is pretty new, especially in the medical field. There's a call for increased transparency so that we can look at diversity, equity, inclusion, and social determinants of health when it comes to AI. Even looking at US FDA approved medical devices, they provide little public information on what data and demographic groups were used for testing. However, we're balancing transparency with also patient privacy, especially when it comes to our pediatric population. So just to conclude, I really believe in introspection when we talk about medicine. Um, so I asked ChatGPT what it thought about medical exams and what can AI do and not do. So this is what it told me. So don't kill the messenger. Said that it can do a really good job with diagnostic imaging, like x-rays, CTs, MRIs, mammograms, and I'm quoting AI, sometimes even outperforming human radiologists. It said it can do really good job with pathology and histopathology, can find cancerous cells and normal cells really well, does a great job when reading an EKG or looking at ophthalmology like diabetic retinopathy or age-related macular degeneration or glaucoma, and also does a great job reading genomic sequencing. The things that AI says it cannot do, and I will admit this sounded like it was written by a lawyer, but discussed that it cannot do physical exam skills, doesn't really care about clinical judgment, emotional intelligence, or empathy, does isn't really concerned with confidentiality, informed consent, or beneficence. Um, it also said AI algorithms operate based on predefined algorithms and rules without moral agency or accountability. So these are just some of the things to take into account when we're talking about the use of AI. And just in conclusion, in my two cents, I love putting up there, um, AI holds potential to revolutionize pediatric medicine by improving diagnosis, treatment, patient outcomes, but it's really crucial to address the challenges of bias and access. And our goal really is for every child to receive equitable and personalized care, regardless of background and circumstances. So we really need to collaborate. And this includes having doctors in the room when we create AI, um, when we create AI programs. So thank you so much. Uh, excellent work, excellent work. Put the bar high. I'll try to excellent work. We are now down to our last speaker, last and certainly not least, uh, Dr. Morgan Jeffries, uh, is the Associate Medical Director for Artificial Intelligence at Geisinger, an integrated health system at Central Pennsylvania. Dr. Jeffries completed his medical school and neurology training at Columbia, uh, which is where we met, and he is board certified in both neurology and informatics. His work at Geisinger is currently focused on building and scaffolding AI governance and best practices across the health system. In his spare time, Dr. Jeffries enjoys forcing his family to sift through even drier versions of this talk and manipulating his long-suffering wife into writing bios about him. 
<laughs> okay, so uh, it's the end of the day, so I'm going to try to get through this uh, quickly. Um, I, so I'm going to be talking to you about health equity in the age of AI from an informatics perspective, and specifically, I mean, from uh, an informaticist working in a health system. Uh, and I added the uh, parentheses, the uh, parenthetical striving for, because it just felt more honest. I have no disclosures. Okay, so um, so this is what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Uh, we're going to probably skip the background part because I think that's been really covered by everybody else pretty thoroughly. Uh, so first, do no harm is where I'm going to spend the bulk of the talk. And what we're going to be talking about is if you're like me and you work in a health system and you're thinking you'd like to uh, leverage AI, you'd like to deploy AI solutions for your users, patients, um, how can you do that in a safe way that's not going to exacerbate existing health disparities? And then the final section, which will be very brief, towards health equity, we'll talk about some ways that potentially AI could be used to advance health equity. All right. Uh, this we will skip because, you know, that we've been over all this stuff. Spent so much time making these slides. Okay, uh, first, do no harm, mitigating bias and unfairness. All right, so what is bias? Um, there are a lot of definitions of bias, but for uh, when we're talking about AI bias, there are two that are particularly relevant. One is a pattern of errors. So if you're shooting at a target and you're just missing kind of all over the place, that's just random errors. But if you're consistently missing over to the left, that's a form of bias. You're, you have uh, non-random errors. Now, the second definition is one that's probably a little bit more germane to a discussion of equity, and that is differential treatment of two groups where one group is treated more favorably than the other, and it could be intentional or not. And that sometimes could be called discrimination, or the term that I'm using here and that I use elsewhere in the talk is unfairness. Okay, so what's going on here? So I'll give you a little bit of background. So a lot of times health systems or payers have programs where they try to identify high risk patients, people that are gonna be high healthcare utilizers, and uh, they will target them for some kind of intervention. So if they, if they know that uh, they can say that somebody's gonna go to the ED or they're likely to be hospitalized, possibly admitted to an ICU, then they can uh, direct some intervention toward them, like maybe a health coach, something that's expensive, they couldn't really do for everybody in the plan, but uh, they can do for selected individuals. And if it works, if you have a program like this that works, it's great because you save money. You're not you know, spending as much on these really expensive parts of care. And then also patients have better outcomes. So everybody wins. But in order for it to work, you need some way to identify those patients up front. So this is a model that was built for that purpose of identifying those high-risk patients, the ones that are likely to become high healthcare utilizers. And uh, what you're seeing in this figure were results from a study that was published in Science in 2019. And basically, uh, and I know our last speaker covered this, but I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to discuss it also. Uh, so what, um, what the researchers did was they, they looked at this model and they took uh, a group of patients and then they ran them through the model and they calculated their predicted risk from that. And then they had this separate way of assessing their risk, which was the number of active chronic medical conditions. And so what you're seeing in the x-axis is the model's predicted risk and the y-axis is uh, the, uh, the separate assay. And so another way of thinking of it is, is x-axis is how worried the model was about these patients and y is how worried the model should have been about these, how worried the model should have been about these patients. And so uh, yellow is white patients and purple is black patients. So you can see the model is systematically less concerned about the black patients than it should have been. So... How does this happen? Right, so what the model is actually trying to predict is the amount of healthcare spending per patient. And for a variety of reasons, historically, there's been less money spent on black patients who are equally sick compared to white patients. So there's a combination of uh, measurement bias, which is, you know, uh, there's no, I mean, there's no direct way to say how sick somebody is. So you got to come up with some measure, but systematically it's going to underestimate. So that's a, that's a kind of measurement bias. And then you have this historical unfairness and those work together to build this biased model. Now let's think about what this model is actually used for. This is used to identify patients who really need some extra help and to direct resources to them. So basically, as a result of this, you've built a machine that systematically denies care to black people, which is not good at all. Nobody wants that. And so this, this kind of process, this general process is called automated discrimination. And it's why it's important for us to discuss this because you don't wanna accidentally do something like this. 
Okay, now if you build an AI application, there are a lot of parts to it that are not the model. And you can introduce bias in any one of those parts. And so I'm gonna skip a lot of this, but I'll just uh, cover a few parts here. So one thing is like, if your model is gonna be displayed in users, um, do they need special technology for that? And if so, do they all have that technology? Like if they need smartphones to access or like specifically iPhones, you know, not everybody has an iPhone. And there might be some people that systematically are less likely to have iPhones and you should keep that in mind. Um, the actions taken as a result of model outputs, that, that matters. So let's say that you have a model that predicts no-shows for clinic appointments. There's a couple of ways that you could handle that. One is if you have somebody who's a predicted no-show, you double book them for an appointment. Another way to handle that would be to call those patients up and say, do you need a ride to your appointment? And one of those is more likely to exacerbate existing, uh, existing health disparities than the other. Uh, another one is uh, feedback loops, looking for feedback loops in your application. So this comes up with predictive policing models where you, know, you have a model that says, uh, we think we need more police in this area. So then you assign more police officers to that area, but then they end up taking more reports because there's more cops in that area. So then your model thinks that there's more crime in that area and it keeps sending more and more police officers to that area. Okay. So how can we prevent this? Like if you work in a health system, what are you supposed to do to stop this from happening? So there are, these are six elements uh, that I picked out from, uh, well, various places. And I, I think it's debatable whether this, you know, these are exactly the right six to focus on, but I think these are, this is a good jumping off point to, uh, and you know, good points of discussion. So the six uh, that we're gonna talk about are governance, teamwork, data sets, transparency, measuring, and by measuring, I mean measuring model bias, and monitoring. Okay, so governance is basically the framework for fairness. If you don't have governance in place, then you know it's gonna be hit or miss whether you're causing problems or not, whether you're exacerbating health disparities or not. And governance basically has multiple responsibilities, but the big ones are establishing policies and procedures, identifying roles and having some accountability, and then making sure that there's sort of a backstop in place for feedback, you know, for people saying, hey, I think this thing is saying the wrong stuff. I'm seeing some real problems with this, that there's always, you know, even if the team that built it weren't responsive to that, that there would always be somebody to go to and say, I think you need to address this. I think we need to address this at a system level. Governance for uh, AI bias doesn't exist separately from anything else. Uh, you know, generally speaking, systems should systems would need to have some system of uh, uh, some form of AI governance, overall AI governance in place. And this would just be a part of that. Uh, teams. So uh, there are three kind of uh, prongs to this. There's the core team, which would be the group that you know would be building these applications. Uh, then you would have your stakeholders and then your end users. So the core team would be, uh, would be people with different levels of uh, different areas of expertise, like data scientists and machine learning engineers, but also maybe ethicists. Uh, this is also something where behavioral economists can be valuable. And of course, subject matter experts. If you don't know this, uh, the people who build these applications often, they have no idea what the practice of medicine actually is. And they really need people who know what it looks like on the ground and know what they need to build uh, for them to build the right things. So having people who have medical experience, but you know, who will also have some familiarity with AI can be very helpful. Um, the stakeholders are gonna be people that bring you ideas for things, you know, I think we need to solve this problem. Uh, and then the people that are obviously affected by that, but it's also good to run impact assessments to figure out who these sort of invisible stakeholders are that you might not have thought of and engage all of those people. And you wanna go through uh, what, I, what I talked about with the, you know, in an earlier slide where I was showing the different parts of the application, you want to think through each step of your application uh, and think how it could impact disparate groups. Um, and then end users, uh, you know, end users, if possible, you want to engage in participatory, participatory design. That's not always really feasible. Uh, you may need to, you may need to provide some training. I would say in general design, good design is better than a lot of training because uh, you know people tend to forget their training, but if, you, if their application is well-designed, hopefully it's obvious what they're supposed to do and then accept feedback from them. Oh, one thing on the core team that I didn't mention, duh. Uh, it's ideally you have, in addition to having a mix of expertise, you also have a mix of demographics because everybody's got their blind spots, uh, but the broader mix of people that you have, the less likely that you know something critical is gonna fall into everyone's blind spot. Data sets. 
Okay, data sets are important for, if you're building your own models, data sets are important for training. But uh, even if you're not, they're important for testing and what's called local validation. So if somebody gets, uh, you know, if you buy a model from a vendor and you want to use it locally, they may tell you that, you know, they may tell you performance metrics for it. But there's no way to know whether that's going to apply to your local population unless you have a data set that is representative of the population that you're actually going to use that model with. So uh, questions to ask about your data set, is it, you know, is it representative or is it possible that certain groups are underrepresented? Um, uh, what kind of biases might contain? Uh, missing this, we'll skip this, it's a little technical, but uh, basically sometimes there are data missing for individual, uh, for, for individual patients. And if you're not careful about the way that you fill in that data or account for that missingness, there's a chance that it'll make your population look more homogenous than it actually is. Transparency. Okay, transparency gets a lot of hype. Excuse me. Okay, I feel like um, it's something that maybe is overemphasized in some cases. If, if models work perfectly all the time, um, from an operation standpoint, transparency would not be important. Like if they just work perfectly, it would be like, who cares how it works? I don't know how most people's brains work. You know, it's it's fine. But models don't work perfectly all the time. And so transparency helps when a model's not working for you to diagnose exactly what's going on. It's also, sometimes a model can look like it's working, but then uh, through, because you have the transparency, you can see that it's actually not working in certain subtle ways. So it can be useful for that purpose. Um, these are three kind of a general approaches to transparency. Uh, actually, I'll start with the one on the end model cards, which is basically like a, it's like a product label. So include things like, well, this is the kind of, this is the data set this was trained on, or this is the population this was trained on, and would include things like, you know, what evaluations were used for it. Um, simple models, which are basically models where the parameters of the model are readily interpretable, like a linear regression model. If you're using normalized data, you can look at it and say like, well, this parameter has like a really big weight attached to it. So it seems like the model thinks that's really important. And then post hoc explainability um, is very powerful, but it's uh, a little bit computationally uh, expensive. So um, there are a lot of examples of that, but one, one good one to uh, kind of give you a sense of what this means, uh, there are things called saliency maps for computer vision models. So you can basically, uh, you can basically look and see, okay, well, this image got this classification label, but these were the parts of the images, that the image that seemed to be really important in making that classification. That's saliency map is. Measuring model bias. Um, if you have the right data sets, you're already, uh, you're already part of the way there. Uh, you also have to choose what populations you wanna look at. So you should think about protected classes like age, sex, race, various other things. But you should also consider what are generally unprotected classes, at least they have no federal protections. So level of educational attainment, uh, income level, um, and then uh, you may need to consider intersectionality depending on the particular situation. And then the other one is, uh, this one's tough. I, I don't wanna get too deep in this one because uh, I know we're, we're pressed for time, but measuring the right things, um, how exactly you go about, uh, how, you, how exactly you go about deciding whether the model is treating everybody the same way. Um, there, for classification models, there are, uh, I'll, there are more than this, but there are two broad strategies that you can think of. One is classification parity, which is basically you choose some performance metric and you say, okay, for this group versus this group, is it roughly treating these? Is it roughly getting the same numbers on these? And then calibration, uh, calibration is a little bit more like what we saw in the previous um, in the previous model that I showed you where uh, you saw the plot of white patients versus black patients. It's basically like looking at different risk levels, uh, how the model performs and whether it does the same with the different groups of interest at each of those different risk levels. Okay, monitoring. Once you, you know, so once you've deployed your application, you're done, right? No, you have a lot more work to do. In fact, it, it ends only when you actually retire that application. So you have to, uh, your population can actually change over time. And so the model, which maybe didn't seem like it was biased when you, when you first checked it out, it actually could become biased as, the, uh, as your population changes. So you have to continue to monitor for that. The other thing is that like, I, I mean, I already said, you're, there's a lot more in your application than just the model. So you can't really assess the impact of the application until it gets out in the wild. And so 
monitoring as part of that, looking at you know, how this actually affects people in the real world and are there disparate impacts. Uh, feedback, I know I put star ratings here. That's not really what I mean by feedback here. Feedback is more, you need some way for your end users to flag if they see an obvious problem or if they see something that they think looks funny. Um, so generally you would wanna be able to accept kind of some kind of free text feedback uh, that you could say, that you could say, okay, well, uh, a lot of people to flag this as a problem. We should, we should probably look into this. Uh, and then you gotta be prepared to take action depending on what you find out. And that may mean retraining the model, that uh, could be mean redesigning parts of the application. In some cases, it could mean retiring the application. Okay, so does everybody do this? No, no, uh, no. Uh, but uh, don't, I, I, I don't want you to, I don't want you to feel discouraged by that because there's a lot of things that have to do with ML ops that we're not really good at yet. So most places, if they have AI governance in place, they don't really have a mature AI governance framework in place yet. Um, and that's something that we're seeing more and more of, but it's gonna take time for us to get up to speed. And like I said, governance is the framework for everything else. So if you don't have governance in place, uh, it's hard to get all the other parts consistently right. Uh, the other thing is that uh, it's hard to find talent in these areas. I mean, you know, you're, you're in the greater New York City area, so maybe you don't see this as much, but depending on where you are in the country, it can be harder to find machine learning engineers or data scientists. Um, and then, you know, there's also those other areas of expertise that I mentioned. And then if you were specifically trying to have, you know, this demographic diversity, that means, you know, you're looking for minorities who are by definition going to be harder to find and who also may be underrepresented in these fields. It can be tough too, if you are, if you're, you know, if, uh, if you work in a system like this and you're trying to convince the people who are doing the hiring, who are already having trouble filling these positions to add additional constraints on uh, and say like, yeah, but I think we should try and, you know, we should try and diversify the team a little bit. That can be a harder sell. Uh, I'm not making, I would, I would do that, but I, I'm not the one making these hiring decisions. And the third thing, and this is probably not going away, at least not anytime soon, is that it's just harder to do all this. Everything that I talked about, that's all extra work that has to be done on every project. I'm not saying that it's not worth it. It's, it's definitely worth it. Um, but I think that's going to factor into um, how consistent people are about this. Okay, bias mitigation for generative AI. Again, for time, I'm going to cut down on this. Uh, what I will say, I'm going to focus on that uh, middle, top middle box. Flexibility cuts both ways. When you have something like an LLM that can just produce whatever text, it, it, it's relatively easy to say how well a classifier is performing. Relatively, it's actually still kind of complicated. But it only does the one thing. It just classifies things into one class or another, sometimes multiple classes, but that's it. But when you have a model that can do that, but also just generate anything else that can be represented in text, which is a lot, you know, it's very hard to measure performance. And that's actually something that we're only gradually figuring out, even not, not really even specific to AI bias, but just in terms of performance, how, uh, how to accurately capture that. Um, yeah, I will skip past the rest of this just for the sake of time, but uh, they're in the slides if anybody wants to look. Okay, very final part here. So some ways that AI could maybe help to promote health equity. Okay, so uh, you can see what's depicted here is a clinical encounter. The doctor sitting there staring at the computer screen looks uh, looks kind of flummoxed. Uh, doesn't, uh, you know, seems, uh, seems like he's perplexed by what's going on. Uh, and the patient sitting in the background is, you know, kind of being ignored. I, I did not say to make it a white male doctor. So that's something that to keep in mind. Also did not say to make it a white patient. Um, okay, so um, if, you've, if you've seen patients, which I guess people in the room or you know, a lot of you probably have, uh, I don't know if there are med students that are attending virtually, but um, you know, uh, in, addition to, in addition to talking to the patient, examining the patient, you know, a lot of times you're forced to, uh, to look at the computer, to look something up, maybe to, to do at least some level of documentation while you're there in the room. And it's, it can be a lot to balance, particularly when the UI is very clunky. So as that cognitive load starts to build up, people tend to use more and more cognitive shortcuts 
So just one example would be an automation bias. If you get an alert in the middle of you know, seeing a patient and you've already got like 10 other things that you're balancing, you may just kind of go along with what it says without saying like, I don't think that makes sense here. Um, so AI scribes, if you're not familiar with them, the, the basic concept is uh, it you know, records you while you're in the room with the patient, it generates a transcript, and then it, it converts that transcript into a note. Now, there are also, I mean, these things are actually being rolled out. Uh, this is one application of AI that's actually seeing use. And um, the companies that are building these are starting to build, are starting to build up more features for them. Uh, so doing things like automatically queuing up orders. If you say, you know, we're going to order an MRI of your brain as part of your plan, that it might queue up the order for an MRI brain. Uh, for you, uh, you know, not necessarily sign it, hopefully not sign it, but at least have it, you know, ready to go for you. So as you start to unburden people, as you start to take that cognitive load off of them, maybe they'll be less prone uh, to, to making, to taking some of those cognitive shortcuts. Um, and also maybe they'll spend more time talking to patients and asking other questions that they don't have time to get to now. Like, all right, so you're not taking your medications, but maybe let's talk a little bit more about why. Um, this one, so, uh, a friend of mine posted this on, uh, posted this on, on, uh, LinkedIn, and I thought it was a little bit crazy. Um, and I was surprised to see how well it worked. Basically he put up a, he put up a toy application that he'd built, which was, um, an interactive reader for a consent document for a total knee replacement. And this was not going to be used with patients. Uh, this was just something that he built. Uh, and he said, Hey, network try and break this. I want you to try and, and have this thing. I want you to try and force this thing to do something unsafe. Um, and it was actually impressive. Uh, I tried to get it to give me terrible medical advice. And I kept trying to bring in like symptoms that I knew were totally unrelated to a knee problem. And it, it very appropriately kept directing me back to, well, you should ask your doctor if you have any questions. I, but you know, even in some cases saying that actually sounds definitely not related to your knee and also something that you should probably seek emergency care for. So, um, you know, it's, it's actually impressive even where they are right now. Now, um, you might think, well, okay, that's a, that's a fun experiment, but how does this relate to equity? Well, I mean, you know, we give patients access to their documents, but we don't give them access to understanding their documents. Um, so if you had something that, you know, you could give patients and it's, it's like, yeah, these are your discharge instructions, but also you can just ask this bot if you have questions. Uh, and, and even, you know, without having to write to your doctor and wait for that long turnaround time, uh, maybe it can answer some of those questions up front for you. That could be very helpful. This could be particularly helpful for people who have low health literacy, uh, you know, where maybe they don't really know what questions they should be asking. It could even propose questions for them. Like, hey, maybe the next time you see your PCP, you should ask about these things. Now, uh, well, I'll, there's, there's, a, there's an issue with this that I'll, I'm going to, talk about it together with the, the next example, uh, which is on the fly translation. So um, hospitals have a sort of minimal obligation to provide translated versions of documents to patients. It's actually not most things. And it depends uh, on how likely they are to run into patients with limited English proficiency, how critical of the services. Their HSS has identified certain what they call vital documents, which includes consent forms. Um, Discharge instructions aren't explicitly named as a vital document. Um, and so it's, it actually is highly variable whether patients get translated forms of uh, discharge instructions, which, you know, if you're, if you're like me and you live in central Pennsylvania and, you know, your patient population is maybe not uh, advantaged in every way, but they are at least largely English speaking, uh, that's uh, okay. I mean, it's very rare that you run into patients or, well, it's relatively rare that we have patients who don't speak, uh, who have limited English proficiency. But in a lot of other places, it happens fairly frequently. It would be great if you could provide, you know, if you could provide, uh, you know, documents to patients in their preferred language all the time. So the problem with this and the problem with the previous example that I gave are that uh, even though this works most of the time, there's still a risk that it's going to say something uh, very screwy every once in a while. And so I think um, even if you could demonstrate that on balance, there's an overall benefit for patients, it's very unlikely that health systems would roll something like this out because they wouldn't want to undertake that risk of that, you know, I'm not even going to say one in a million, let's say one in 10,000 chance that it says something very dangerous. 
um, you know, which is noble to an extent. But again, I mean, uh, there's a chance that also, I, if you're not providing, if you're not providing primarily Spanish-speaking patients discharge instructions in Spanish, you know, how many, how many of those major errors do you have to encounter to offset the fact that they're just consistently getting discharge instructions in English, which they're going to struggle with too. Um, so we're not quite there yet where we could, where we could actually roll these things out. But I think it's, I think it's interesting and I think it's um, heartening that at least there's not the same technical hurdles that there would have been in the recent past. 10 years ago, this would have been science fiction and now it's not. Okay, so closing points, artificial intelligence and machine learning comprise a powerful set of technologies. Uh, there's a risk with AI applications that you're gonna worsen health disparities. I gave you some uh, tips on how you can help limit that risk. And then there's a potential for AI to increase health equity in ways that weren't possible before. Most of those aren't quite ready for prime time, but hopefully in the near future, we could start to see some of those things. That's it, thanks. All right. Any any questions from any of the talks throughout the day, particularly the latter the latter talks? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do our wrap up with uh, Batil. But I, I mean, thank you all. I mean, you know, I want to first. I don't. I'm not sure if Wianda is still there. Wianda, I want to thank Wianda from our office who did a lot of work in putting this all together. She's not. I don't think she's here. I think she, <laughs> but uh, she did a lot of work to really keep things together and make sure we had. We had some nourishment in the back and organizing our speakers, um, et cetera. Thanks, very special thanks to all of our speakers. Really, it's it's really a, a, you know just amazing how many people have so much knowledge of this new area, this AI, and really going really deep into it. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over to you, to Matilda. And I thank you, Dr. Etienne, for all that you do and for really kind of helping to organize and, and get the panelists together. So one, I wanna acknowledge and thank our presenters. Uh, another round of applause for all our presenters and all who joined today. AI is advancing rapidly and presents both opportunities and challenges in healthcare. So it's crucial to strike a balance between embracing the benefits and mitigating risk while also keeping people's well-being at the forefront. Um, some top level takeaways um, from today's session was Data is only as good as we put in, and the risk of data set bias and lack of representation needs to be addressed. Um, there is a need for algorithmic transparency and appropriate safeguards to mitigate biases, privacy, and ethical concerns, as well as vigilance and auditing and monitoring to ensure we use AI responsibly. Uh, we hope today's discussion brought new insights and made you think more deeply about the use of AI and our ongoing responsibility to eliminate disparities and unequal treatment for patients, especially those from historically disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, this concludes our conference and I thank you. Excellent, thanks Matilda. I'm just gonna make one, one last one last comment. The, the data, I love what you just said about, which was covered today, that you know, bad data in, bad data out. And for this audience, I think it's critical. We saw a few of our, many of our panelists that were already engaged in the AI. It's important that diverse communities, really everybody, um, you know, Black, Hispanic, Asian, these are groups that are historically left out of the clinical trials. LGBT communities, we need, we need them all involved. People who are disabled, um, they're left out of all these algorithms. Um, so, neurodivergent. neurodivergent individuals. So there's a lot of different groups. So if you're from any of those demographics, it's important that you really start to learn this language uh, I'm sure Mar Marie will give you a nice tutorial again if you didn't catch all the stuff she taught, but really get it, start getting into it um, and be part of the actual solution and not just be in, you know, in the kind of the peanut gallery hanging out in the back and seeing what's going on and then complaining about it afterwards because the algorithms are all bad. You can actually be involved in the development. We're still, I know it seems like it's, it went full speed ahead, but we're still at that, I think, still at the very beginning stages. It, it looks like it's far, but it's really not that far. And it's going to keep skyrocketing. And you've got to get in now if you really want to make a change uh, and impact this, this area. So with that, thank you. We'll see you next year. This year, this is February 29th. It's, it's not going to be on the 29th next year. <laughs> so it's not possible. <laughs> but we'll see you next year in Black History Month. Thank you.